I'm going to go through this presentation, and by the way, you're welcome to take pictures of any slides. I am actually going to give this presentation to Tracy um, when we're done here, so he'll actually have it if you want copies of certain slides. But i got to also introduce my wife, Jane. Go ahead, Jane, back there. There she is back there. And you cannot secret shop a place without a woman since women account for 80% of all consumer spending. I'm waiting. <laughs> There's usually a guy in the audience that pipes up and says, that's all? <laughs> but it's actually true. And, and by the way, she sees things totally different than I would see them as a man. And so that's really good. So we make a great team doing that. Now, what we've been doing is what we call a destination assessment. This is part of a sustainable tourism plan that you're doing for Blowing Rock. But what is the destination assessment? That is where we have been secret shopping you. I would not let Tracy, the mayor, anybody, Charles in the chamber, I didn't let them give me any input on where to stay, what to do, where to eat, nothing. We had to come in. We wanted to experience Blowing Rock just like anybody looking for a place to live, looking for a place to visit, or looking for a place um, to, to invest. And so that's, we wore these different hats. And by the way, we have assessed more than 2,200 communities, as Tracy said, around the world. Um, and, and there we go, all over the place. And so it's been quite a wild ride. And we have been assessing you for a week. And by the way, this is only the, this is the second time we're in Blowing Rock. And I'll get to that in a minute. But we look at, when we secret shop you, we say, okay, let's plan a trip to Blowing Rock. And by the way, prior to us coming here the beginning of May, I had never been in Blowing Rock before. I'd heard of Blowing Rock when we were working on Asheville, and of course I knew the Blue Ridge Parkway, and I'd spoken at North Carolina Main Street, the Governor's Conference, but I had never had the chance to be here. So we looked at marketing. Was it easy to find information? Was it good enough to close the sale? How did you stand up to the competition? But our focus, particularly on this one, was what we call the on-site assessment. Your signage, your gateways, your wayfinding. We're able to find. I got to tell you, when we came down 321, we didn't even know where Blowing Rock was. And there are visitors that think that's it. And the next thing you know, they're in Boone. And Boone really appreciates that. And so overall appeal, critical mass, I, I'll explain that, amenities, parking, restrooms, information, um, attractions, what is there to see and do in the area, customer service, do you cross sell each other? So we looked at all of those. And by the way, this is not just as a tourist. Like I said, we wear three hats doing this. Is this a place I'd want to live? Raise a family, maybe retire as a place to work, invest in, or bring a business, and as a place to visit for more than just a day trip. And so we went through this whole thing. We took a gazillion um, photographs, and this is all part of a larger assignment that we have been charged. And so this is what, where our focus is. What else can be done locally to make Blowing Rock a better place to live work in and visit. That's the bottom line. And notice live is highlighted on this because this is about the, the conflict between residents and, and tourism where, where we start to butt heads in terms of certain things. But that is really the entire focus. But if we wanted to narrow it down even more, what can be done locally to mitigate the effects of being an extremely popular tourism destination and the effects it has on the quality of life for local residents? I mean, that's really down to, you know, particularly during the peak travel months. So those are the hats we're kind of wear, we're wearing. Now, in this presentation, there's two parts. Number one is, is the town and, and the TDA wanted to see me come during the shoulder season. So we were here on May 1st, 2nd, and 3rd, over a weekend, just to see what the difference is between the shoulder season and the peak season. And now, of course, we've been here for the last week. Um, exactly. And by the way, we're going to be here for the next several weeks. So we're actually going to see what happens over this weekend. 
So what you're seeing is this week, this past week, but we're going to also show you that. And then what happens is next week, we will start talking to your residents, businesses, community stakeholders. There is an online survey. It's live right now towards the end of this presentation. I'll give you that. We want to hear from you. But what you're going to see now, and, and by the way, out of that, we'll find the core issues, and then we need to figure out a way to address those. So it improves the quality of life for residents, and it improves the visitor experience. And so with this, today, you're only going to see suggestions. There are no recommendations because we've been seeing your shop to you. We haven't talked to anybody locally yet. And so it'd be presumptuous for me to come in here and tell you what you should do when we never even ask you for your input. So remember, today is a conversation starter, not meant to have all the answers. Okay? And so, but that's our, that's our process we're going to go, we're, that we're working on. So I want to talk a little bit about the Blowing Rock experience. And I'm going to show you a bunch of photos. When you look at these photos... I want you to look at the number of people in the photos, and I also want you to look at the visitors, what they're wearing, what they're doing. Are you attracting the right kind of visitors? Are you suffering from over-tourism? So I want you to look at these photos, which I took last Saturday. So I did it the busiest day of the week. We were here on Friday, we are here Saturday, we were here Sunday. We've been here in the fog, we've been here in the rain, we've been here in, and Saturday was a fantastically beautiful day at the end of June, so we're in your peak season. But, so I want you just to keep that in the back of your mind as you look through these. And so, we started by visiting you in the shoulder season. There it is, when we were here, it was beautiful weather, um, but we did experience one of those days, pea soup fog, um, which you're all familiar with, and we even experienced some rain. You can see the trees were just leafing out. And so we did do that. And we started that when we came over the board. We actually RV'd here. We weren't sure at the beginning of this year where we were going to be with COVID. We've been trying to outguess COVID for more than a year. And so we stopped at the visitor center. When you come into North Carolina on Interstate 40, and we walked in there, and our first thing is, you know, this summer, right now we're heading over to Asheville, Blowing Rock, that whole area, but we're going to be coming back in the summer. Would you advise, is a good time to go to Blowing Rock? You know, and the lady behind the counter said, you know, son, and I found, woohoo, yeah. <laughs> When's the last time somebody called me that? She goes, you know, the entire mountains of North Carolina are going to be busy. And no, Blowing Rock is no different than the rest of them. Okay, so that was there. I went, well, that was nice. She didn't say, oh, my gosh, you need to avoid it in the summer. There's too much traffic. She didn't say that. So that was an interesting experience. And then and I said, well, can we get some information? We walked right over and knew where the Blowing Rock brochures were, the Blowing Rock Guide and a couple other pieces. And then, of course... Um, you know, our one thing that I will tell you right off the bat is when you come into town and you're confronted with three-hour parking in a downtown where the average visitor spend four to six hours. So number one, you're sending people away before their wallets are empty and they are here for your downtown. Your downtown is the draw. I mean, yeah, we might combine that to Grandfather Mountain with, with some of the other great attractions you have, uh, the Blowing Rock. But that was our first thing we saw that we were a little disappointed with. Now, in this case, we did, see, we did find public parking. Some of the signs were a little hard to read, and we were brand new, never been here before. But it took us about 15 minutes to find a parking spot. So it wasn't bad. So it was about 15 minutes, and that's the beginning of May. And we ended up right here, right just down over in this parking lot. That's the first one we found. There was parking there. We took it. So that's back in May. And so we did walk around out. You can see everybody masked up everywhere. And so we did, we walked all over downtown, went in the shops, uh, spent time at Memorial Park, uh, looked at the intersections, um, did your businesses. I mean, you know, and even then, the beginning of May, we had to wait 15 minutes for a place to eat. 
So, so it wasn't like we had to wait hours or anything, but it wasn't like we just walk right into a restaurant on a Saturday, the beginning of May. I love this, this on the public restrooms right here in town. And to this day, I'd like to peel off that red tape and see what's said behind it that got, that got redacted. But, and it was, you know, use it your own risk. This was probably all COVID. While we were here, yes, we went and visited Grandfather Mountain, um, which has been on my list for a long time. Uh, it wasn't overly crowded. It did say they were limiting the number of visits in May because of COVID. Um, but, uh, and, and we actually were here. We had a couple of friends actually joined us. So there were four of us here. And so we did experience that. We also went over to the park, Grandfather Mountain State Park, and looked at how many people were hiking. And, and it was pretty busy for the beginning of May. So then we came back, and we've been here for this week, like I said. Here we go. And we're going to be here through the middle of next month, or the middle of this month. I guess we're already in July. And so when we did this, first thing we did is went over here to this regional visitor center, and we walked in and said, okay, here we are. It's, it's the end of June. Is it going to be safe going into Blowing Rock? And the gentleman said, well, you know, there's no big events going on this weekend. You should be fine. So it sounds like when you have events, it's a problem. When you don't, you're going to be okay. Okay? And so that's great. And there they do give away the, the um, I think, one of the guides here. And by the way, it said, I would like to see a brochure holder for the Blowing Rock Guide outside. I always think visitor information should be always working 24-7. So we got high country there. I'd also like to see the Blowing Rock Guide there. I think that would be great. Now, with that number one, it's a suggestion. You're going to see like 40 of these suggestions. That's all they are. They're not recommendations. Some of these you may say, well, that just makes sense. Let's get a, let's get a brochure holder there. You know, that does that. And by the way, even that, remember, this is the end of June. There wasn't a ton of people out there picnicking, and it was a beautiful day. So, so far, we're not seeing all these crowds. You know, we're driving down 321, um, you know, and then we, obviously, we see, you know, I think you're one of, what is Asheville and Blowing Rock, the only two cities or towns that are actually on the parkway out of 500 miles. And so I thought that was pretty cool that you have direct access to, to one of the great attractions, one of the world's best drives. And by the way, that's from National Geographic. And so then we saw your gateway signs, and we saw them. I just took pictures of this one. But they're excellent. They're beautiful. They're well done. And, and I think they were recently, I think Charles just told me just before this meeting that they were repainted. Great job. Because I, I thought they were brand new. And that's how important it is. First impressions or lasting impressions. It was a nice feeling. Love that. And then we did stop here at the Middle Fork Greenway. And by the way, when we stopped there, there was one car in the parking lot, and it was ours. So here we are at peak season. But it looks like it's going to be fantastic when it's fully developed. It's beautifully landscaped. I mean, everything about it looked great. There was a bench there. They talked about the sponsors for this, the funding of it, and then actually talked about how the Greenway is going to be developed. And, and I thought it was fantastic. And on there was a, a mount on a rock was this. In every walk with nature, one receives far more than he seeks. I thought that was an excellent quote. So I'm going, man, this place is awesome. And so when he did this, there, this is why I say, you have what 99.9% .9 of all communities in North America wish they had in terms of assets and wish they had in terms of, of challenges. There are 20,000 incorporated places in the United States. You know how many are dealing with so-called over-tourism? A handful. And you ha what you have here is absolutely phenomenal. And so is it any wonder visitors want it? You know, I mean, we went to the, even just at, at the Blowing Rock, um, just the views alone are worth the price of admission. 
And of course, we had to go there because we heard a very important person is tied very closely to this attraction. <laughs> and actually, we would have gone there anyway. But, but we went there, and by the way, I'm, you know, it's, it's, it was just stunning. Um, you know, everywhere we went, amazing collection of retail shops, beautifully landscaped. You know what you reminded me of when I got into downtown? Carmel, California. You remind me of Carmel with one big exception. You're family friendly and they're not. It's a huge difference. They don't have the playground. They don't have all the places for the kids to go in Carmel. I mean, and I love Carmel. And Carmel, by the way, has made one other serious mistake. A while ago, they outlawed any galleries. They were one of the largest arts communities in the United States. They outlawed any galleries coming in. You know why? Because people have the art shipped home and we're not collecting sales taxes. They're being shipped out of state. And those shops are being filled with Gucci, Sunglass Hut, all the change you could get closer to home. I hope you never have, I hope you actually have zoning in your downtown that does not allow chains and franchises to keep it unique to you. But you have a great collection of shops. I mean, just everywhere that you go. And by the way, the number one activity of visitors in the world, not the reason they come, except in your case, not, the reason they come might be Grandfather Mountain. It might just be uh, the Blue Ridge Parkway. It might be a number of things, but the number one activity once they arrive is shopping, dining, and entertainment in a pedestrian-friendly setting. And that is where 80% of the non-lodging spending takes place. You're one of the few towns in the United States that's getting that 80%. This is why Disney put downtown Disney outside each of its parks. And so, I mean, and by the way, the ice cream shop in May had a longer line coming down, and down the sidewalk than it did in June. And so, I mean, you have, your eateries are fantastic. We've, we have, I don't know how much, money, how much weight I've gained since I've been here, but probably plenty, because we've been eating at your restaurants morning, noon, and night. And they've all been good. I mean, you've got the casual dining, the fine dining, you name it. But they've all been absolutely excellent. Now, remember, I want you to look at these photos and see what you see at the end of June. You know, I, you know we ate at the cellar the other day. And, I want to, and, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about that in a minute. But I mean, it's, it's just incredibly fabulous. I mean, the, the Brahms, is, is, it's world class. That's fantastic. I'm so glad you have that here. Um, I mean, it was just, just incredible. And the fact that it's free was even amazing. I wish there, I didn't see a donation box, but I thought, man, they should put a donation box somewhere so that people, if they want to, can still contribute. But I thought that was excellent. They do just a great job. Even the little 1888 museum, I just think it's charming. And once we arrive, we want to learn about your history. And I think that's really important. As a matter of fact, one of my favorite things at Brom was the, the whole display about the history of Blowing Rock. And so, I, I mean, and out here next to, um, next to Tanger Outlets, that museum, I mean, everywhere we went, you've got a lot of history and culture. We visited a lot of your attractions, very much family-oriented, um, you know, we didn't get a chance to, by the way, we didn't get a chance to go in all of these because we were busy working. But they all look fantastic. And so we thought that's, you've got the high quality, yet you're still family friendly. And I thought that was amazing. You know, places like the Blowing Rock. And so when we went to the Blowing Rock, you know, we went there. There was no line. The parking lot was fairly full, but it wasn't crammed full. We didn't see long lines of people waiting to get in the door. This is the end of June. And, and it was just absolutely fabulous. I mean, it's just stunningly beautiful. And of course, we, you know, we love, yeah, there's the mascot. I think there's one of three. Is that right, Mayor? Yeah, I think that, and this cat, you know, the second you go, kitty, 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 he just plops down waiting to be petted. And I notice he's got quite a following on Facebook and everything. We talk about the Blowing Rock. 
And we also met other locals there as well. They're out getting tan. And so, I mean, it was, it was great. Um, I mean, even your lodging options are fantastic. You have every kind of variety. Um, this is uh, Chitola. Um, did I get that right? Um, Green Park Inn. I'm so glad I read that that was about to be torn down. I'm so glad you saved it. Um, even all of these, these little, you know, they do an excellent job. Matter of fact, there's a ton of photography. I'm going to use a blowing rock to teach other towns how to do it right. Because you do. I mean, most smaller motels like this, they, do they look near that nice? Of course not. And so, I mean, just everything about this place. You know, incredible amenities. I would call a local park an amenity, like Broyhill Park here. I mean, I just think it's absolutely beautiful. By the way, I didn't see any trash on the ground. I didn't see crowds of people walking around the lake at the end of June on a Saturday. And the locals are probably good. Good, let's leave it that way. But, I mean, it was just stunning. Remember, this is the middle of the day on Saturday, not at 7 o'clock in the morning, but like lunchtime. And so, but it's still just stunningly beautiful what you have. You know, I mean, there's little things. There's, the, there's Jane. There's no benches in the gazebo. Come on, you guys. Really? And so... But still, and even when you're down there, they give little, I wish all your signs look like this, all of your signs. You know, I love that, the fact that if you're down there, the, there's two or three places to say, here's how to get back into downtown, which I thought was fabulous. And of course, you have one of the most beautiful main streets in North America. And, and I don't say that lightly. One of the most beautiful main streets in this entire country, in this entire continent. I look at that. It's just stunning. I mean, it's the hanging baskets. It's, you know what? There you go. You have hands down the most beautiful town hall we have ever seen in the country. <laughs> and I've been in all 50 states and in, we've worked in 2,200 towns. I've probably been in 10,000 of the 20,000 incorporated places in this country. I mean, it is absolutely stunning. I couldn't believe, I've never seen so many tourists take a picture of a city hall in my life. <laughs> You know, unless they're trying to complain about it. But, I mean, look at it. I mean, it's just stunning what you have. You know, even you have a downtown that's about people, not cars, which is the future of this country. We tried to build our economy around cars. As a matter of fact, you're going to see coming to you in the next 10, 15 years where you don't have vehicles on Main Street, believe it or not. That's what's starting to happen around the country. It's been happening in Europe for centuries. They were built before cars. But I was really glad to see a downtown that was about people more than about cars. And yes, we got to accommodate the cars. I'm going to get into that. But one thing that really surprised, I thought when we first got here, I thought, well, I think we need to get rid of all the park on Main Street so we can widen the sidewalks. So we can get more people on sidewalks. I never saw an issue with the sidewalks being so overcrowded. I saw one guy once walking in the street because there was a family with a stroller going down the sidewalk. That was once. And we'll see it this weekend. We'll see if it's even worse, you know? And, and, uh, but that was our experience this last weekend. You know, I mean, having just the gazebo here and places for them to eat their kill ones, ice cream, um, you know, the, the playground equipment was not overcrowded. It wasn't overrun. Um, I, I mean, we were just pretty amazed. And if you look at these visitors, we didn't see, you know what? We worked in Gatlinburg. Gatlinburg came to us and said, Roger, we have a problem. We used to be an arts community, and all of a sudden now we're full of t-shirt shops, souvenir shops, just cheesy stuff. And he said, what happened? I said, I know what happened in Gatlinburg. You became a coupon destination. So you are getting the budget traveler because the high-end travelers are going to Greenville, South Carolina. They're going to Asheville, North Carolina. That's attracting a higher-end visitor. In your case, I didn't see really any visitors that look like, oh my gosh, we're getting the dregs of society here. I didn't see visitors. I didn't see one single visitor throwing trash on the ground. I didn't see people smoking out there. I didn't see any of that. I really saw a good mix of visitors that were 
pretty much you know middle income to higher income. And I, I, I was pretty impressed. Um, you know, I love the fact that you have visitor information everywhere in downtown and around. And I thought this was great, talking about where to go hiking and having that blowing rock guide right there at your hands and in multiple locations. I mean, this just keeps going on and on. You have restrooms. I never once saw the restrooms, lines of people going to the restrooms. And now I have to give a lot of credit to probably the town because I did notice they brought in bigger trash receptacles on the sidewalk to handle this time of year. I did see some porta potties in a few locations to supplement. That's what you do when you're a popular tourism destination. So hats off. I didn't see trash anywhere. And maybe that's because the town people are, they're just out there making sure everything's spotless clean. I mean, you even have free Wi-Fi downtown. And by the way, there it is, town park Wi-Fi. And look at that, I was getting like 70, I can't even get that where we're staying. <laughs> I say, man, I could stream movies here all day long. Now, I do think you need some signage because I don't know if anybody even knows you have free Wi-Fi in downtown. So it'd be nice if we, we kind of knew that. But I thought having those kinds of speeds was pretty darn good for free Wi-Fi in a downtown. But even when it came to your residential, we kept going, like that house? I want that house? Oh, I wanted that house. I just like to stay with those people. You know, we're doing that all over town. I mean, it is just beautiful. By the way, does somebody here own this one? Okay, we, we want to know. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but, you know, here's the thing. This town feels safe. It just feels safe. You can just relax. You can just... I mean, it just, everything about it just seemed, this is who we are. I didn't see any pretentiousness, even though you have high-end shops. I just, I just, everything about Blowing Rock, we just thought, wow, how do you secret shop a place like this? Now, is it any wonder why you get people here from around the world? Really, do you blame them? I mean, you know, and, and so that's a challenge. And by the way, we're here in June, July, but I can't even imagine. Now, these I did grab off the internet. I, could, I, can, I was trying to think of a better holiday shopping destination than Blowing Rock. I can't. I mean, this is just, and so I thought, man, we got to come back here in the winter sometime, I mean, to see this. You know, I, I just thought it is just phenomenal. I mean, plus you got the skier. Yes, we did find the ski mountain. And, and I mean, even up there, they have a, a skating rink in the, in the winter months, which I thought was fabulous. And we haven't even talked about your fall color yet. You really have an outstanding 12-month destination here. And I think that is so important. And if you look at the people that are drawn here, we see families, we see strollers. These are just snapshots we took. We didn't see any unsavory characters in town, trashing the town. Um, we did see groups of motorcyclists, and they were not hell's angels. I mean, we, I mean we, this is just look at the people. And so I just thought, man, you're attracting the right kind of visitors. I didn't see any real problem with how you're handling them. I mean, just look at, just look at the place. You know, I can't wait to start sharing these photos of people saying, go, where is that? I got to go there. And, and, but even things like this, I'm going to talk about that in a minute. It's, it was perpendicular to anybody reading it. Or, I mean, it was parallel to anybody reading. But even out, this is, you know, the, the resort. Um, and, and, I mean, even, even at Speckled Trout, they had music there. Saturday night, and I went, man, I wish there was music in downtown more than just there. But the place was crowded. I mean, these are people trying to spend money in your town. There's some of our motorcycle friends. But all in all, does this mean Blowing Rock's done? Well, you know, practically perfect in every way. Isn't that how they describe Mary Poppins? You know, and, and then I thought, no place is ever done. No place. Not Asheville when we were working there. No place. And so there's always work to do. It's a process that never ends. And by the way, there is no going back to the way it used to be, even in Mount Airy. 
They've done a fabulous job of transitioning from Mayberry to transitioning to being a wine destination. I mean, there's, and there's still, you can, yes, there's still pieces of Mayberry, but if you ask somebody under 40 if they've heard of Mayberry outside of North Carolina, you'd be hard pressed. They'd go, where's that? And I can't tell you how many gazillions of smaller towns we've been in where they say, we just want to be Mayberry and go, sorry, it's already taken. But you can't go back to whatever it used to be. That's no longer an option. And so our big question we had to ask is, does Blowing Rock suffer from over-tourism? And I was a board member of the United States Travel Association for several years. And we had to de define what over-tourism is. It's the inability to mitigate the effects of having so many visitors that businesses cannot accommodate them. I could not find one single business in Blowing Rock that said we have too many customers. <laughs> not one. Now, I haven't surveyed all of them. This is just anecdotal when we'd walk into a shop. There was no lines waiting to go into any retail shops. Lodging is at or over capacity during the peak seasons. I didn't talk, there's, I can't find any lodging facilities that say, we're, we may, they may be full on the weekends, but I saw vacancies this last weekend. And then, you know, the environment isn't being overrun. And you can see this background photo, and this is a big problem. We ran into this in Springdale, Arizona. Springdale, Arizona is a town of 600, right at the entrance to Zion National Park. Utah did an incredible marketing campaign called the Mighty Five. Five national parks, all of them in southern Utah. The tourism at Zion National Park went from 2 million to 4.5 million in 24 months. So in Zion, they were starting to have problems with the environment being overrun because the National Park Service didn't give them additional budget for Utah's marketing. So in your case, I didn't see trash, and maybe that's credit to locals or the town. I didn't, there's no trash out there. I didn't see it on the sidewalks. I didn't feel like your environment was being really overrun. And then your infrastructure cannot accommodate the influx of visitors. Now... This is public restrooms, this is parking, this is traffic. And so when we were here, there was never a line on 321 trying to get into downtown Blowing Rock. And to give you some examples of over-tourism, this is Branson, Missouri, where sometimes it's a, it's a population of about 10,000 with seven and a half million visitors a year. There are times when you can be parked in a line of traffic for an hour just trying to get into Branson. Now that's a real problem. I will also tell you that we worked in Sedona, Arizona, population about 5,000 people. In Sedona, I remember that we were working in Sedona, but we decided to go there on a weekend with our son and his wife and so we did it, and it was Memorial Day weekend. It took us six hours to go seven miles. Six hours to go seven miles. That's over tourism. And so, so I mean, that, and it's, it was just insane. I mean, it even backed up not only those seven miles. This is Interstate 17 before you take the exit to go in Sedona. I mean, we've worked in Gatlinburg where the line's going through Pigeon Forge and everything. You know, Great Smoky Mountains gets 14 million visitors a year. Most visited national park in the country. And sometimes there's huge lines that they have to deal with. But you know what? So far, we're going to be here this weekend. That's Saturday going right up sunset. I didn't see it. I just didn't see it. You know, we didn't have to wait at any retail shop to go inside. And I even made a note here. Let me see what I wrote down here. You know, we could not, yeah, there, there is, yeah. So I already said that. So we, you know, the sidewalks are not overcrowded with pedestrians. I do think you need to work on sidewalks. Um, crosswalks, I mean. And, and um, 
you know, the longest restaurant time was 30 minutes. So I got to tell you a little funny story. So on, was that Monday, Jane, that we went to the cellar? On Monday, we were here in town, and we thought we were out looking for Zap Endurance. Has anybody been out there? You know how hard that is to find, let alone get to. We're going down there to find it. And so we said, you know what, let's find a place to eat for dinner. So Jane called the cellar restaurant. This is at like 5 o'clock. And said, could we get a table at 6 o'clock? And this is Monday, not Saturday. On Monday. And they said, well, I'm sorry, we can't. You know, we have a table that's, that's, that's all, your book tells at 7.30, you know. And so we don't want to push you through dinner, but... You know, and so he said, okay, can we do it for 5.45? She goes, okay, no, no problem. Well, at 5.50, we called them because we were still down here, and we had to get there. We arrived about five minutes to six, and this is on a Monday in the summer. We were able to make a, restaurant at, make a reservation at one of your very best restaurants half an hour before dinner. Now, granted, it wasn't Saturday. Maybe it would have been longer. The longest we had to wait for food in this town was 30 minutes, which could happen in downtown Charlotte or anywhere. And so, you know, and we did go down there and find that. And by the way, it, I read in the Blowing Rock Guide that this place is clear full during the summer of all these endurance events and everything. There wasn't even a car anywhere in sight. So I'm not sure if it's just an event venue or whatever. So we did have dinner at the cellar. It was fantastic. You know, so these are the, you know, we couldn't find one single lodging that was at over capacity. Some of them are very, very pure full on the weekends, but I still think you even have some weekdays you need to accommodate that you could accommodate guests in the summer. And then, of course, the restrooms were clean, and this is my my hat's off to the town for adding extra just to add to the capacity. I didn't see that they were really well used. And this was interesting. I never saw anybody eat at any of these tables. And I thought, are we just too close to the police station? <laughs> I mean, really, I couldn't. They were, they were never used. And there's public restrooms there as well. And of course, they're right there as, as well. And so I, I just... So I'm, I'm having a hard time figuring out how you're dealing with over-tourism so far. We even went down, I think this is Bass Lake, is that, did I get that right? Okay, we, were, we saw other lakes, I'm going, is that the, did I take the picture of the right one? And while the parking lot was full, we didn't see garbage there. We, we did see people on the lake, and, and it was very busy. But it wasn't overcrowded. So here's the bottom line. Blowing Rock does not suffer from over-tourism in the true sense of what the word over-tourism means. However, you, locals and visitors, suffer from a severe lack of parking. That is your big problem. And by the way, if I get here, you, we, we, every single frontline employee, a waiter, waitress, a, 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 front de a person at a cash register shop, we asked almost every employee we came into contact, where do you live? And it was like 99% boon. And then I would ask, where do you park? You want to hear what they said? And by the way, I asked that we would ask them, do you carpool? No, because we all have different hours. They all bring their individual cars here, most of them. And remember, this is just anecdotal, what we're finding out. But they would say, well, if you get here early, like before 10 o'clock, there's plenty of parking. They say, but if I work the afternoon shift, I get here 20 minutes early so I can drive around trying to find a parking lot. Or I heard that, well, I just park my car where I can, and then at three hours, I take a break and I go out there and try to move it. Or... Well, I'll just get the ticket. It's worth the eight bucks. And I think it's 10 now. It's worth the eight bucks not to have to deal with it. So people are willing to get a parking ticket rather than deal with parking. These are employees. And so I thought that was fascinating. So if you get here early, this was on Monday. 
Um, and and you're about, you got about 90% full right around noon is when it really starts to fill up. And so we went around and started counting parking spaces. And this is just rough right now. The Legion building, I don't know what you call these lots. There's 110 parking spaces right here, including in front of the building, including down below. Park Avenue, we counted 26 spaces there. Maple Street, 43 spaces. Broyle Park and the pool parking down there. I'm going to talk about that. Brom Parking, we counted 58. This is upper and lower decks. Main Street, there's 99. I didn't count Sunset, but there's probably another 15, maybe 20 there. But the bottom line is, in your downtown, you have 394 spaces. That's less than half of what you need. I mean, so let's say 400. I mean, and by the way, I did not count bank parking. I did not count church parking. I did not count uh, post office parking. Um, let's see what else I put in here. I did not count private parking lots. Um, the post office. I didn't include any of those. So that's just public parking, whether it's all day or whether it's three hours. And so we're sitting here dealing with this. And it turns out you have about 90 businesses downtown. So I'm not talking about out on the highway. Is you have about 90 businesses, not including lodging, because I assume those probably have their own parking for employees and guests. Okay? And then if you had three employees per business, now some retail shops might have one or two employees there, but some restaurants might have 10 or 12. But if you had three employees per business times 90, you would need 280 parking spaces just to house your downtown staff. That doesn't count city employees or, or the bank parking that has their own parking. These are retail and restaurant businesses. And, and so you know what that means? That leaves 114 spaces for residents, their visitors, your visitors, and tourism. No wonder you've got some problems. I mean, that's, and, and so, and now, with you, when you talk about, I went to North Carolina Department of Transportation, what is the average number of people per vehicle when they do traffic counts? And they said 2.75. So I thought with 2.75 per vehicle, you can accommodate about 313 visitors at a time. Now, one thing I'm not including in here is there are people staying in your hotels that just walk downtown. So these are the people that are driving in from Boone. They're day visitors. Heck, Jane called her, or talked to her sister the other day who lives in Seattle, and she says, and Jane said, we went out to Bowling Rock. She goes, oh my gosh, I visited my friend in Charlotte. And she said, while you're in Charlotte, we got to go to Blowing Rock. From Charlotte, a day trip. And so I'm, not, so I'm just talking about people that are driving in cars. And then we might have another 300, but that's not very many. No wonder you have an issue. You know, if, if plus, there you go. They can walk downtown, thank goodness. Now, so... There are about, you have 38 restaurants, not all of them are downtown. There's Outback, you know, Steakhouse out there on the highway and stuff. But if they had, if your restaurants had just 10 four-place tables, if your restaurants could only accommodate 40, which I think almost every restaurant in town could probably accommodate twice that number. But even then, that equals you could, you could have at least 1,520 guests filling up your restaurants. And so I sat there and I went, okay, if you had one third of your capacity using this number, you could accommodate 510 guests. I mean, at a quarter capacity, you could, be, you could have 380 people eating in your downtown. At 20% capacity, we have 304 guests. Remember, I said you have room for 313. So we could have 304 guests eating lunch at 20% capacity and nine people would be left over for shopping. Now, granted, once again, I'm, this is just very anecdotal, but we're just trying to wrap our head around how much parking you need. And, and so, you know, yeah, Sedona has it, Pigeon Forge has it, Gatlinburg has it, you're way, way under, you don't have enough parking. That is your problem. 
And by the way, I don't think there should be any more parking up here in downtown. Highest and best use of downtown is not more parking lots. I mean, this, it should be out at the highway. And so your entire problem is not capacity of the streets, retailers, hoteliers, attractions, or restaurants, but large lack of parking and, and uh, capacity. And so plain and simple. And I've been doing this for 40 years as of January. I mean, I've been to these places. This, to me, it's not rocket science. And so, no wonder people are frustrated. <laughs> I mean, I get it. If, remember, we're wearing three hats. As a place to live, I'd go, oh my God, I don't know if I want to live here in the summer. Because if I have friends and family visiting us, I don't want to take them downtown as a resident, unless I lived within walking distance, and spend an hour looking for parking, which is what we did. And I'm going to tell you about that. And so, with that as kind of our initial background, remember, I have not talked to anybody locally. You may say, Roger, you're all wet. Wait till 4th of July. But you know what? Are you going to hang your entire industry on seven holiday weekends of the year? I mean, we still got, there's still things you could do, and including the holidays. So... One of the first things you need is a wayfinding system. Yeah, this just drives me nuts. You're not exactly on the grid pattern. Have you ever looked at a map of Blowing Rock? Every road is like this. <laughs> I mean, you have, and you have zero wayfinding. If we're coming down 321, there's not even a sign that says Blowing Rock exists. Now, right now, you're probably going, thank God. You know, because the, the next thing we know, they're, you know, and there's no wayfinding. And by the way, I would route them up Sunset. Or I'd route them up the, the north end of Main Street, not the south end of Main Street, where you're, which is primarily residential. You know, but I, there's, there's no signs. You know, even we drove by Tanger Outlets twice before we knew it was there because the sign is set so far in off the road. You know, and so, but there's no wayfinding that says outlet mall museum next left. There's no, the only wayfinding you have in Blowing Rock are signs telling you how to leave Blowing Rock. <laughs> really? 221 that way, 321 Boone that way, Lenore that way. It is, it's true. Even if you're downtown, go look right across the street from Speckled Trout. You can leave this way, that way, or that way. <laughs> and so... You know, I mean, and by the way, we never even saw this parking lot half full. And I understand traditional malls are, are struggling across the United States. Half of them have already closed. Uh, outlet malls are not far behind. We did notice a lot of vacancies there. And I kept going, oh my gosh, this is underutilized. Could we do something with it? And so another suggestion, you know, this sign right here, right across the Speckled Trout, is when you're in a car, it's above your roof line. This sign right here needs to be down here. Now, the reason it's not down here is because it conflicts with these signs. Well, these signs are easy to see. This one here is really hard to see. And it doesn't match your other parking signs. So we don't even have continuity. But here's the scoop. And we did this in May, and by God, we did it again in June. We came up and said, let's go park down there. And this happened in May, it happened in June. We turned left there, and, and we turned left there, and um, there it is right there, up really close, and it's way too high, way too high. And so we turned left, and the first thing is, we're being sent out of town, right? I mean, there's nothing down there. I see a bunch of cones, and this is this year, Stero steep winding, stero steep, narrow steep, little, let me spit it out. Narrow steep winding road next 19 miles. And I'm going, ha, we're not, we don't want to leave. So we drive down, and unfortunately, our turnaround spot is now blocked off. In May, we were one of four cars that turned around right at that intersection to go back. In June, we went here, and I went, there's no signs that say where parking is. 
So when there's no reminder sign to say, you keep going, you're almost there, you need to make them, it should say parking next left. It doesn't. Until we were looking for parking spaces, working for you, we never even knew there was any parking down here. So once again, both times we tried to turn around here to go back. And then when you turn around, we see signs like, don't even think of parking here. <laughs> Which I thought would crack me up. I love that, actually. <laughs> and so, you know, okay, message received. And so, you know, then when we finally did go down there, now we see two signs, one going off that way and one going off that way. So I'm sitting there going, okay, so we're parked now by the pool. I start walking down the street trying to find that parking because there must be a fork in the road that points you off that way. These arrows don't point to the left or the right. They point off into the sky. <laughs> they point somewhere else. And so I'm going, what the heck? Maybe if these arrows were pointing left right here, because if I'm going to go that way, that was our assumption. I mean, and then, by the way, I walk down past these signs. I turn around, and now parking is going off that way. Or no, no, this is still going down that way. And then I went down there, and I turned around, and now here they are going that way again. I just came from there. And so these are the kinds of things that are so frustrating. I have no idea where on earth this is. And if you're telling me this is public parking, <laughs> you guys have to quit these half-ass measures. I never once saw any vehicle ever parked there. Cool. Saturday. Was it on Saturday I didn't see any? No, this weekend. This, okay, we'll see it this weekend on a holiday weekend. <laughs> but, but you've got, I mean, I just went, you got to be crazy. And by the way, you know, this is Saturday. I, if we would have known about this, it, this might have been full last Saturday. We didn't find it last Saturday. We found it on Monday. And I thought we saw, my gosh, I didn't realize that. And we found it. You know how we found it? It was actually by going from downtown into the park. And then we saw the parking. Because we remember, we gave up going down that road. Because the wayfinding wasn't there to finish the job. And so... On Saturday, we drove around for 45 minutes trying to find parking. Now, here's part of your problem. We, came, we were on Main Street. We turned down that way, down 221, to try to find that parking. We turned around. So now we come back to Main Street, second time Main Street. We come down here to this parking lot, and it's full. So we turn around. We go back to Main Street a third time. Then we go down by the museum, turn right, and that parking's full. So then we come back to Main Street four times. Before we found parking, we were on your Main Street six times in 45 minutes. We were just one car. I wonder how many hundreds of cars are circling around like a bunch of sharks looking for that elusive parking space you know, that's just what I mean. Your parking problem, if you can fix your parking problem, you can fix your traffic problem. Because I wonder how much, as a matter of fact, I saw a new red Jeep pickup truck in town. And the reason I picked it out is because I haven't hardly seen these new Jeep pickups are brand new. And this was this beautiful cherry red. And yet I could watch this pickup truck going in and out of every street trying to find parking. We weren't the only ones driving up and down Main Street, driving down all your side streets. I mean, if I was a visitor, if I was a local, I'd be just going crazy with that. It took us 45 minutes. That was Saturday at 11 o'clock. Remember, in May, it took us 15 minutes. And by the way, let me talk about that for a second. There is six times, and on sunset, three times before finding a parking space. And so... You know, we, these signs are great, but they need to be part of a coordinated wayfinding system. It needs to say, okay, keep going. Because if we go, if we go 1,000 feet and we don't see a reminder sign, 
then we're going to turn around and say, hey, there's no parking here. You're sending us out of town. You know, and so that was, that's a real challenge. I like the signs. You know, they could use some repainting, but that's the very nice. They need to be repainted every three years. There you go, another suggestion. And then this one here was just the cat's pajamas. When's the last time anybody ever said that phrase? I don't know where that came from. This is a little, this is Maple Street. So I went, okay, this is fine. We're driving a big truck. We'll just go down Maple Street. I turn that and I go, ah, really? You want me to go down? That's like a one-way street. You can only fit one car. That's a two-way street. What? Are you kidding? And now I understand where locals go in the post office. They can't get out because it's two ways up to the parking, then one way coming this way. Why don't you just make it one way the whole way? If you're coming in from Main Street to the parking area, and if you're leaving the parking area out to Sunset, just make it one way. So what happens is, can you see the frustration? We're just like, okay, we can't go down there. There's a trolley. I don't know. We didn't go, where the hell did that trolley come from? I didn't know there was a trolley here. And so, so then if you go down there and say, oh, yeah, by the way, there's the public parking because the sign's on the wrong side of the street. People always look for directional signs on the right-hand side of the street, the way they're facing. So we added one here, but this is do not enter. It says do not enter right here. And we're going, can I, can I still go in the public parking or am I treading on the do not enter part? I mean, this is the confusion of, of first-time visitors. And so, you know, this one here, it needs to be lowered about two feet, three feet. It needs to be way lowered so it's easier to see. And that's coming in from the Main Street side. And, and then once we found this, it was like, okay, we get it. And it did fill up on, the, on Saturday. But right there at this parking, there's this map. And we had this map, and I'm going, man, I wish I could take that map with us. Because it does show parking, you know, I mean, like right there. Now, this is parking right here. It seems to me that the parking lot is right on top of the parking garage. I still can't figure out that drawing right there. But at least it shows parking, and then it shows you are here. But then we have the Blowing Rock Guide, which has an entirely different map. <laughs> That's not to scale. You need to have these things matched. Because if we're on foot and we're looking at your guide, it should match what you have here. Because this, it was just, it just really frustrating for us to figure out where the parking is. You know, and you do have parking there, parking. You know, we have restrooms here. So this gives you some right here. But we're kind of, and I still don't know what this one is. Is this the pool and this is the park? It seems like this is all one parking lot. But see what I mean? We're just like, these need to match. By the way, you want a good wayfinding system? Head down the street. That is um, Hickory. Hickory did a fabulous job with wayfinding. It's even on the suburban streets. Go down to Hickory, find out who did your wayfinding system. It's excellent, and it was well done. Now, Hickory's way more spread out than you are. You also need pedestrian wayfinding, and I'm going to get to that. But that's in Hickory. This is in Gatlinburg. They ripped up the streets to put the power underground and everything, and part of that is we designed them a wayfinding system to make it easy. The easier you make it, the more likely you are to close the sale and the more likely you are to rede reduce congestion and a bad experience for both locals and visitors. This is in Appleton, Wisconsin. These are about $700 a piece. They have an aqueous coating so ice won't stay, stick on them, graffiti won't stick on them. They got stainless steel hardware and they're mounted on existing power poles or light poles in their case. You need a wayfinding system. Every single city and town that is put in a wayfinding system has seen an increase in retail sales and services. It's an investment, not an expense. And so, hire professionals. It's a science as much as it is an art. We worked with a guy named Todd Mayfield out of Florida that when he does these, it gives me a headache how he does what he calls a message schedule. Because you can never put more than five items on a sign at one point. It has to be easy enough to read from 500 feet away. 
I mean, the, all these are examples of wayfinding. They can be decorative. I would love to see yours on wood posts. I know it takes more maintenance, but I love to see those. I think your parking signs you have are great. It just needs to be part of a larger system. This is Woodlands in Texas. It looks like a sign that'd be in a place called Woodlands. You also need pedestrian wayfinding. This is Kalamazoo, Michigan. They've got a historic district and a civic center district. And so they make it easy to find things. You also have a lot of shops that are on side streets. You know, I mean, just go to any Disney park and you're gonna see how important wayfinding is. So you need pedestrian wayfinding like this. This is in French Lick, Indiana. You know, and it doesn't have street names. It'll tell you where parking is, where public restrooms are, where more sh additional shops are. But you need a combination of pedestrian wayfinding and vehicular wayfinding. And if you want to see an example of it, head to Gatlinburg. And you'll see both. I love this in Greenville, South Carolina. And what they did is they did more to explore signs to get people off their main street down side streets. And what's cool about this, this little lip here comes off and they could slide these businesses in. So if a business changes, they just slide it in. By the way, the businesses pay, I think it's like $20 a month to be in a whole bunch of these. So they pay $20 and they're, they're in these and, and that way it's always flexible. It works. In Greenville, granted it's a much bigger city, but, but it absolutely works. Cool things you can do. So these are just way of helping people find what you have to offer. You know, so there you can see it. And by the way, navigation systems are not a substitute for wayfinding. I got to tell you, us trying to find the Chitola Environmental Preserve, is that right? Did I get that right? Sporting, sporting, yeah. And we, we, we even got the address, typed it in, no navigation system ever heard of it. We could not find it, okay? And so we use navigation systems to tell us where things are that we already know exist. Your wayfinding tells us what you have that we didn't even know we should look for. So that is not a substitute for wayfinding. It plays a role in your branding efforts. It should look historic. You should fit the ambience of Blowing Rock. It's a major component in your marketing. It reinforces a positive experience. It increases spending. It educates visitors on locals. And it builds community pride and it mitigates traffic and parking issues. So when you do a wayfinding system, they will des they'll design the entire system right down to fabrication drawings. And there, right now, there are a ton of federal grants that could help you do this. As a matter of fact, I think one of your two counties right here in Blowing Rock are already working on doing, I think I read something online, trying to do it countywide. You should be a part of that. It doesn't mean your sign should look like Boone or anybody else, but you should still be part of the larger system. It would save a lot of money doing it that way. But this is all what's involved in a wayfinding system. They, all signs have to meet federal highway standards. I mean, these are all these elements of wayfinding, you know, and, and this is, happens to be in Bracebridge, Ontario. And they were so happy when, there's the mayor in the middle there, and they were so happy when they put their wayfinding signs and their retail sales services increased by 20%. And people had a better experience as residents and as visitors. And so we even have a video. Um, we have the Destination Development Associate. There's even a video that tells you how to do wayfinding. And Tracy has access to that. I would guess to design the system for Blowing Rock would be probably thirty to 60000 That includes vehicular and pedestrian wayfinding. It's one of those things that you could do right away that would make a, huge develop, make a huge difference. There's tons of companies out there. You wanna make sure you get somebody. We use Todd there, but there's many other, you need people that are, this is what they do for a living. Not architects, not graphic design. Wayfinding is its own thing. It's environmental graphics. Corbin does a great sign. My guess is they're the ones who did Ickery. Um, they're one of the best. This is uh, Cloud Geshen out of Philadelphia, but wayfinding. 
Just doing wayfinding could make a huge difference. Then you could also create design standards for all the private ones. Because here we have private property, no parking, not for restaurant food pickup, no parking anytime. We have three signs like within all a foot of each other. Then you see signs all up and down here, all over the place. I mean, you know, it seems like we could create a coordinated private parking. I understand the, them doing this. But it's just all hodgepodge. Everybody's just tacking up their own signs everywhere. I didn't know there was any place in town that even had permit parking. You know, and then another thing is, could you quit changing the name out there? I mean, why is it Blowing Rock Road, Blowing Rock Boulevard, Blowing Rock Avenue, Highway 321, Valley Boulevard? Now I saw James Holzhauer Jr. Boulevard somewhere. And then, you, and then we call locally, they call it all the bypass. It's like, come on, you guys. I'd work with Department of Transportation on that one because that's ridiculous. And by the way, down in Lenore, we hop on Blowing Rock Road, you know, and, and so it's just, these are the things that are confusing. Okay, there you go. You can probably reduce your traffic problems by a third just doing that. Now, here we go. And you would create a better experience for both visitors and your local residents. Because local residents wouldn't be near as frustrated. Now, we could not find the Chihu there is Sporting Reserve. We typed in this, it doesn't, we couldn't find Google or Apple Maps. Neither one of them even knew what this address was. You know how we found this? We actually went to the resort and at the gate they handed us a brochure and it told us where it was. Yet this is promoted as one of your attractions. We also went to try to find your zip line tours and we end up going down 5,000 Potholes Road. <laughs> if you've been bound, if you have not been on 5,000 Potholes Road, just go out there to the zip line tours and you will be on it. It was a nightmare. And so what happens is the, the regular road ends, it becomes a dirt road, and that dirt road is extremely rough. Now, I don't know, is there a way to get here without going on 5,000 Potholes Road? Yes, sure there. How would we know? No wayfinding system. This is how our navigation system told us to get there. See what I mean? And so that is the challenge. I mean, we even looked for Broy Hill Equestrian Preserve. It took us to this intersection said, you're there. I went, wow, it doesn't look very equestrian friendly right there. But we decided, well, maybe it's down the road. And then we used like Google Maps actually said it was at this intersection. So I'm going, so here's a road. I'm going, where? There's no signs. There's nothing there for it. I mean, as a matter of fact, we were amazed to see horses just walking around in the parking lot, <laughs> not even behind fences. I went, wow, this is a cool equestrian preserve. <laughs> But see, this is what happens with navigation systems. They're not always correct. So we decided, well, maybe we should drive down further. And then we found it. This is why you need wayfinding. And by the way, this is an amazing facility. But we wouldn't have found it. I mean, we, we, did, we were able to find Wahoo's Adventures. And, you know, thank goodness they put those big, you know, the... the uh, the floating tubes there, because that red caught our attention going down the highway. But all of these, you know, I mean, the same with, we took us to the ski hill, but there was no wayfinding to it. We had to make sure, you know, it wasn't going to take us to the other ski hill. And, and so this is why you need wayfinding. So now, next one, parking shuttle. We're walking around downtown on Saturday. We go, oh my God, there's a shuttle. Where did this come from? Where does it go? I mean, there's a shuttle here. And, and how often? I can't find any information. We can't find any signs. There's nothing written on the side of it. It's just there. And then all of a sudden it just vanishes. <laughs> and then like 20 minutes later, we see this. We go, oh, wait, 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 free shuttle. Where to and from? Where does this go to and from? And by the way, is this thing, Apple Car, is this related in any way to the trolley? No, two different things. See, how, as a visitor, I see free shuttle, the trolley, I don't know what, I thought the we thought the trolley was a pay for hire. 
We asked, we went into retail shop, restaurant after restaurant after restaurant, and said, we saw a shuttle. This shuttle, do you, does anybody, do you know where it goes to and from? We could, we only found one person in your downtown that even knew about it, where it goes, when it goes, what it is even. One person. There's no information. And I'm going, okay, somebody has the right idea. And not sure, I mean, there's no information. And so then we did see these. It says free shuttle Friday and Saturday. Free shuttle to where? <laughs> and from where? And how often? There is zero. Here's the thing. You send out, you might send out flyers to your businesses. They're not giving those flyers to their frontline employees. And us as visitors aren't going to go around like we did asking every employee about the shuttle that we saw driving down Main Street. You need to educate the consumers. That does not educate anybody. It says, some, it says there is a free shuttle on Fridays and Saturdays, but I have no idea how often it is, where it goes to, where it goes from, no information. And so, you know, and then there's this one. By the way, I turned this one Monday because it was parallel to the traffic. You couldn't even read it unless you were walking past it or driving past it. But once again, and first of all, they stop in two wrong locations. One's in front of the elementary school, and the other one's here. I don't know why they're not being dropped off right at Sunset in Maine. You know, or maybe down by where, um, where Speckled Trout is, 221, 321, that intersection. And so, once again, this is a great idea, but how is any consumer supposed to know anything about this? By the way, we never saw more than three people in a shuttle, and I think they were coming from the hotels. I mean, it just, it's just like, ah, oh, great idea. And so, and then, then finally, somebody said, oh, I think it goes from Tanger Outlets to downtown. And so we went out to Tanger Outlets. Where the heck, in, I mean, am I supposed to drive around this entire parking lot trying to figure out where this trolley starts and ends from? And we finally did find it. But once again, free shuttle, but where to and where from? No information. And so, you know, you should create trolley stops. And by the way, here's the rule with trolleys. If it's not convenient, we're going to drive. So the rule for trolleys is every 15 minutes. Go to Gallenberg, go to Springdale, go to Walnut Creek. I can go to Chattanooga. I can name a whole bunch of towns. 15 minutes. If it's more than 15 minutes, we'll just drive. Convenience. Is that the, that's this microphone making all kinds of racket. So you need to create actual trolley stops. And, and by the way, oh, did, did I put on here, fewer stops the better. And so this is in um, Springdale, Arizona. I mean, Springdale, Utah, excuse me. In Springdale, Zion National Park pays for the trolleys. And they go in Springdale. Springdale's downtown is one mile long. It's just one street. And so they create like, like nine stops between there and the National Park. They said, why do you pay for a trolley in Springdale? They said, because we use their town as our parking lot. But the rule is, at any one stop, you only have to wait 15 minutes. And it takes you up to the entrance to the park where you can get out, you can walk in. And by the way, there's parking in, there is parking inside the park, but there's not enough to accommodate their visitors. That's why they use Springdale in exchange for using Springdale as their parking lot. They provide the trolleys. And so there they are. Every 15 minutes takes you up. And then they have other trolleys that are inside the park that will take you to hikes and stuff. That's what they are. They're stop number three. And it tells you right there, here's, here's where they are. And then, by the way, look at that. Park in town, ride the free shuttle design. Why don't you say park at Tanger, ride the free shuttle of Blowing Rock? I mean, hello. And, and so those are those things that, that you could easily do. There's, and there it is. It's pretty simple. I mean, it's got a sign right there that tells you that's trolley stop, Zion shuttle. It could be the Blowing Rock shuttle. It's stop number three. I mean, you've got it right there. You've got benches there so people can sit. You've got a covering so if it's foggy or rainy or drizzly. 
And if you built something like this, you know what? I could see it. I'd see it anywhere in town. And, and this is in Gatlinburg. And your trolleys should be running seven days a week. If you want to make this work for visitors and your local traffic, your, day, your weekdays are busy. At about noon, your parking is 90% full. Wouldn't it be great if you had parking down there and people would catch the trolley here? We would have done it. I think thousands of visitors would do this easily, as long as it was 15 minutes, as long as we knew about it. The best way to get us to know about it is to create these trolley stops. These are not overly expensive to do. I mean, this has got, it even has their brochure there and a little trolley brochure. Um, it's got other information. They even light this up in Gatlinburg. Uh, you know, they've got other information about what there is to see and do in town. I mean, it works. It's not that difficult to do. This is Walnut Creek, California. In Walnut Creek, which is in the East Bay, it's the end of BART, Bay Area Rapid Transit. And it is Northern California's definitive shopping and dining destination. So what do people do? They will go take BART to Walnut Creek, they will get off BART, and then the trolley takes them downtown. Now, how's the trolley paid for? They do, you can do onboard advertising inside the trolley. Um, you know, they will have like brochure holders. You can see it right there. Right there's a brochure holder. Um, you know, you can sell advertising on there. So there's ways to even help pay for this. And then the other challenge you have is finally, I had to, I, I think I went in, Charles at the chamber gave me this, or maybe Tracy gave it to me when I asked about it. But number one, it's 22 minutes, not 15 minutes. Number two, it has like five or six stops before you ever get to downtown. So you need to simplify it somehow. And remember, these are just suggestions and, and, and ideas. Okay, next one. How about number three priority would be in-town parking. And that is, you know, work with business, a lot of public parking after business. This Wells Fargo customers only. I'm assuming they own that entire parking lot. It is always full, and I'm still at a loss to, the, to, to the Wells Fargo having 50 employees that work in there, and maybe they do, because that's about how many parking spaces there are. But I thought, could we do this? All others will be towed at owner's expense. It doesn't say until after five, or it doesn't say it's just, it's ours, stay out. And maybe there's a way to work with businesses that say public parking only after 7 o'clock at night or something. And it would make us fans of Wells Fargo because you're doing us a favor during the dinner hour or whenever you're not there, if you're op not open on Sundays. But we saw all this parking there. And by the way, we saw an awful lot of out-of-state parking license plates. So I have a feeling visitors are parking there anyway. You know, and, and they're just taking their chance. First of all, we don't know whether it's only for just along the sidewalk or is it the entire parking lot. It's hard to know. So some people are taking their chances, you know, and, but it, it does say Wells Fargo parking only. But we love Rumpel Church. It's my favorite place in town. You know why? Because their parking by the museum says, what does it say there? Welcome parking for Rumpel Church parishioners Sunday 8 to 12. You know what that means? We can park there the rest of the week. I thought, I wish they had a collection box there. I would have given them five bucks for allowing me to park there during the week. And of all the churches, I love this one because they care about me as a visitor. And by the way, they had like, they had like a gazillion parking spots. Now, when we were here, we ended up parking down here. And, and this is another church. And I thought, man, if, no, wait, is this, where's this one? That's the Baptist church. I even thought right here, this, I don't know if this belong, if this is public parking or if it's the church parking. But once again, if churches, I thought, could you do a deal with the churches? 
you know, to where you say, you know, this is reserved for parishioners only on Sunday, such as, even if the town or the TDA or somebody, even if you say, look, if we can use your parking, we have a street cleaner, and I'm making stuff up now, we have a street cleaner, we'll keep your parking lot clean, and we'll pay you $10,000 a year if we can use your parking lot, except for those hours. I mean, there is some parking here that goes unused, and I think visitors are probably taking their chances anyway. Um, but, but once again, you could do that there. There's this empty lot. You know what? I would go to this property and say, tell you what, we, the town, want to lease that from you for a buck a month with a 30-day out clause. If you're going to build something on it or develop it, you give us 30 days notice, we'll vacate it. And what we'll do in exchange for you, we'll get rid of the weeds. We will, you know, maybe do some, add some gravel there, and we'll just provide another 10 or 15 parking spaces. I mean, it, you're taking lemons, turning them into lemonade by doing that. I mean, here's another one right on Main Street. You know, granted, this one's a little tougher to get into, but I thought here, you know, maybe there's some ways to help mitigate this. And then, so I thought you, there, if you could use churches, if you could use banks when they're not open and do signs like that, number one, it'll make us like the church or the bank better because they're providing a service um, and it would help alleviate the problem, okay? And then off-site parking and shuttle and this is your ultimate solution. It's just a suggestion, but we're sitting there saying, you know what? We need parking on the highway and a shuttle every 15 minutes from the highway to downtown, right up sunset. And it should drop them off right there, smack in front of Memorial Park. Just make, whether we create, I don't know how we do this. I don't have all the logistics. These are just ideas. But I saw this. I went, oh my gosh, right there. I thought, man, if the town would own this. And then somebody said, I think the town did buy that. The town already owns this. And I went, now. Could you imagine doing a four to six story parking structure? Hear me out, hear me out. Because that slopes down here, right here it's at street level. It slopes down the hill on the highway. It's this, it slopes all the way down there. You could cut this here, cut it down, do a retaining wall, and, you could, and you'd have access. I mean, well, let me keep going here. And I kept going, my gosh, you could enter this parking garage from the top level off of Highway 321, or you could enter from Main Street down on the side here. This is just a mound of dirt, and it's got roads on three sides of it, except for the back narrow spot. And I kept going, and, and by the way, look, at, I mean, there's where the highway goes down, and you could see across the street, this must be fairly soft. It's not concrete, it's not granite. And, and I kept going, man, can you imagine having an entrance right off of Main Street? And if I was going to have a parking garage close to Main Street, I'd want it on this part of town because then it's really close. And remember, we're going to have shuttles going up this part of Main Street because that is where a lot of your lodging is. I don't want to run them down from the south end of town. I might get south end, which is all residential. I'd rather do it in the north end. But I kept going... I mean, and there's, I mean, this is where, where it wraps all the way around. And I thought, you could do a trolley from here into downtown, just going up Main every 15 minutes, and, and it would be amazing. I mean, I, I kept going, there it is right there. And so I thought, man, if we could, at one point you could see the road, Main used to go back beyond this. Now I noticed Main hits 321 right there. So you don't see it right now, but right now this connects right there. But I kept going, man, if we could somehow do a, a parking search with top floor perimeter landscaping right on the floor. We've done this. They did this in Santa Fe, New Mexico. They have landscaping on the parking garage around the perimeter at the top level. That top level might be only one level above 321. And that parking garage might be terraced as you go down that hill. And they thought, okay, and we could put a retaining wall at that end because we're going to have to dig down right there. And we'd put landscaping all along the highway. There were trees and stuff to help shield it because, you know, parking structures aren't always very pretty. We could even land landscaping all the way around Main Street 
And then this whole corner, you can landscape and put a big sign that says, Welcome to Blowing Rock. Free public parking. Now, and so I thought, why? You could do this right across the street from Food Lion. And so, and that's right there is about the size of a vehicle. Can you imagine how many vehicles you could fit in this place if you had four stories of it? Somewhere you need to get parking and be serious about it. And this is right across the street, so I know it's not granite. You know, I just thought all you do is taking down a, a hill right there with access on three sides. So there's another idea for you. Now, one more. This three-hour parking limit is a killer. The average visitor in a downtown is four hours. In yours, it'd be like six. Every day we came here, we wanted to come here for lunch and dinner. And yet you say after three hours, you need to leave. Because moving your car in the busy season is not an option. We, we, you know what, when we got here, we found our parking space. I'm going to tell you about that in a minute. But when we found our parking space, there was no way I was going to go out there in three hours and then try to find another parking space and spend another hour. No way. That's when I thought, if we get a ticket, fine. I just hope they don't ticket us every hour. You know, because th I mean, that's, that's what you're dealing with. And so three-hour parking dramatically reduces spending. You should do four hours. Now, there's, there's a couple things you could do. And by the way, this is where we parked. This is in front of another church. When we were parked there, I parked there. Then we started walking up Sunset. And, and then I saw this, three hours from here to corner, Yet the parking sheriff was way down below this, marking tires. So I'm going, I don't understand this at all. Is it just on that side of the street, but not this side of the street? I mean, I didn't get this. And, and, and so one thing that really happened, and I'll get to this in a minute. So we parked down here, and I kept going, I know we're going to get a ticket. I know we're going to get a ticket. I'll tell you about that coming up. I'm going to switch gears for a minute. The other thing that you could do, oh, okay, here we go, let me go through this, is you need better crosswalks. Your downtown needs to be about people, not cars. Your crosswalks are starting to get, I would like to see this whole intersection just beautifully decorated. There's a thing called street print, this right here, or duratherm process. This is actually embossed down in the asphalt. You can do chain removal over it, and it's embossed down like three-eighths of an inch. You could have whatever design you want. It could be floral patterns. It could be patriotic. It could be like that. Um, and it's embossed down in there. And it has a 20-year life. And, and these are excellent. And you could whatever design you want. But I thought, man, you should take a couple of your key intersections, like at Speckled Trout, where the highways converge there, and at Sunset and Main, and just really, can you imagine if that was your intersection? I mean, I just thought, wow, this could be so cool. And here you can kind of see how it sets down in there. It's actually stamped down in there. It's actually branding of asphalt. Here they are actually doing it, whatever design you want. And they actually depress it down in there. And here they're doing it, and they just finished. See the guys on the other side of the street? They just finished this side. You could drive on it five minutes later. And it's like six to seven bucks a square foot. So it's decorative. It's easy to see. And, and you need some mid-block crosswalks. Because I saw thousands of people jaywalking. It wasn't really a problem. But it could be an issue. And I just thought you even need, you know, these need to be decorated better. Um, you know, redevelop all your crosswalks. You should make them colorful. You're a beautiful downtown. And so even this, I took this in Lee, Massachusetts, which is, on the, which is in western Massachusetts near the Berkshire Hills. And they made sure theirs was really bright, you know, so that you knew this was a pedestrian cross crossway. And, you know, and I, right here, you know, I know this is all repaved. And you have a new sidewalk. It was under construction when I was here before. But I just thought, man, this should just be, this should just be so pedestrian friendly here. And I could see over there, it looks like there's going to be, maybe there's going to be a sidewalk over there. I'm not too sure. There should be. 
And I would even like to see you do the flags. You've seen towns where they do the flags. You can pick up a flag, walk it across the street, and put it in the bucket on the other side. You put your logo on it. Yeah, granted, one or two people are going to swipe them. You know what? They're promoting Blowing Rock. You know, and I mean, you, but, but there's all kinds of things you can do with your crosswalks that make it so much better and so much more pedestrian friendly. And these might be that same thing. I'm not sure if those are real pavers or whether those are stamped in, but they should be more colorful and more obvious. And there's where I'm going, I wonder if that's gonna be a sidewalk down the road. You know, hopefully so. So now, you know, and here, here's, you have no pedestrian crossing signs or anything. Here's one thing that drove me nuts. If you're on Main Street, and you want to cross over at Sunset, Main Street and Sunset. You want to cross over to Memorial Park, or if you're at Memorial Park, you want to go across the street. If you're going north on Main, it says no turn on red, right? You know what I'm talking about? The only time you can turn is when the pedestrians are walking across the street. That doesn't make any sense. That there just, I said, why do you do that? I would rather have a free right turn, and granted, there's left turns. You could say, watch left hand, yield to left hand turning traffic rather than no turn on red. Because otherwise, you're saying the only time you can turn is when the pedestrians are busy going across sunset. I mean, that's like, and, and there's none of these. You have these out on 321, but you don't have them in your downtown, and it's also a state highway. You can even do the little glowing ones where you push the button and the little lights are in the street, LED lights. So those are some things. So I'm just giving you ideas. So some other challenges. So we talked about that. You know, I put this power underground. Somebody said that next year you're probably going to tear up some streets and, and do some storm drainage or whatever. I put your power underground. I mean, I had a hard time taking a picture of anything in a beautiful downtown without that. It was like, ah! You know, here's your opportunity to do that. By the way, we're working in Gatlinburg right when we are there doing it in downtown Gatlinburg with 13 million visitors a year. And yes, wider sidewalks, pedestrian wayfinding, power underground. I mean, they ripped up this downtown. They did widen their sidewalks. They did narrow the streets a little bit. They added all kinds of wayfinding. And, and this is Cindy O'Gold, their city manager, said it was a nightmare for a year, but absolutely worth it. And so I hope you do that. Power, fiber, all of those things underground, I think would be fabulous um, when you get the opportunity. And by the way, that'd be a perfect time to do your crosswalks and everything else. Also, I would route people up Sunset. I think that you need a gateway at 321 and Sunset, right there. You have some pillars downtown that have like benches in between them. I should have put that picture there. But I thought you don't need a big, huge gateway. Just, just a, something there, something there that just says, what happens is you're coming down a hill both ways. And people are blowing through that intersection, not even knowing what's there. I mean, I didn't even realize there was a gas station there until I started taking these pictures. And I thought, if you could do a gateway there that just says, you know, blowing rock this way, it'll help route people up sunset more than through your residential communities on Main, North, and South. And so if you could do something there, you know, it should be your major entry point in. You could even do decorative over where the creek is right here. But I just thought this should be your major entry point because look at the gazebo up there. I, and this, by the way, we walked this. We parked right down there. We see that little red car and we had no problem walking that. And we're walking right by restaurants and everything. It would add to the value of these properties. And, and like this Cenex station, I think it's a Cenex. I mean, the only way you can even get there if you're going towards Boone is to turn left here. And so I kept going, man, this would help all these businesses tremendously by making this more of a focal intersection. And then, by the way, the other parts of this intersection are not much better either. You would help revitalize this little intersection here to doing some things that are viable. So another idea. I would add decorative crosswalks here as well as up in town. So at this intersection, 
be perfect, perfect time to do that. And so I think that would be a great idea. Right there, right there, right there. And so now, there's some other notes in first impressions. Is we never could find Mayview Park. We kept going, where's this park at? I gotta find this park. We kept driving all, we see Mayview Park signs everywhere. We have no idea what it is. We finally Googled it and found out it's a residential area, I think, of town. But, I mean, no big deal. It's just that we had no clue what it was. We, we were looking for a physical park. Another thing, another observation. I think what they are doing here at the market is absolutely fantastic. They're getting rid of parking to make it about people. And so putting down those paver stones and everything, I think is absolutely fantastic. So hats off to them for doing that. Another thing we noticed is this is Jane, she wouldn't even walk on those steps because every step is a trip hazard. You have to understand that you need to put some gravel in there because it's all washed out or whatever. And if you, you walk in those steps, you'll trip over that. Just get a couple yards of 5 8 crush rock and fill these steps. Because they're, they're, you know, so people, you can see there's actually a trail next to the steps where people are avoiding them. Another idea. Here's another one. What is this going to be? Does anybody know? What's it going to be? A retail shop. Do you know what kind? What's it going to be? A boutique. Rather than promoting the builder, why isn't there the sign that says coming soon, opening this fall, such and such boutique? It's an invitation to come back. Always do that. Always create an invitation to come back. And we'll see it. We're going to say, oh, cool, there's going to be a boutique shop. But written on, there's a little step into it, it's written some scriptures or something. And so we thought, is this going to be a church? Is this something, a religious affiliation? We didn't know. But once again, invite us back. I mean, when will you open? Same with this one. It says cash at, cash build your legacy. And it says cash. What, what is this going to be? Anybody know? Nobody knows yet? They don't, even know. they don't even know. But what they ought to put there is opportunity, retail opportunity. You know, retail or, or restaurant opportunity, whatever it is. And say it says cash, there's a cash sign there. And I'm going, I hope this is not going to be one of these check cashing places in Blowing Rock. You know, I was going, uh, you know, I'd, I'd be really worried about that. But once again, they're not saying this is coming soon or, or anything. This... Why is this on the back side of downtown right over here? My gosh, you need selfie spots. I mean, you want publicity. There you go. That should be off of that wall where I can't even get close to it, can't take a selfie of it, and it should be right, it should be right there. We're getting kind of busy right there, but maybe we put it off to the side over here somewhere where we can stand in front of it and it's beautiful. It needs to be somewhere you need to say, welcome to Blowing Rock. I also thought, man, we should put a trolley stop here. We put that sign there. We got the gazebo there. We got that. You know, what happened is we're just going to junk it all up. But somewhere there's got to be a good place in that park where you could put welcome to Blowing Rock. I just thought, why is it on the back of a building? I think, it, I think that is the coolest sign. I mean, greetings from Blowing Rock. Can you imagine how many people will be doing that selfie thing there? Wow. So, and it's in a place where, I mean, showing that to people are going to go, really? I see a pile of pavers and a bunch of vehicles and no parking signs and, you know. And so it just doesn't really work. And by the way, you should have hashtags. Wherever you have Welcome to Blowing Rock, you should put hashtag I love Blowing Rock or whatever your hashtag is. Tracy, where's Tracy? Is there a hashtag? What's the hashtag for Blowing Rock? Got still plenty of them. Love Blowing Rock. Love Blowing Rock. So whatever it is, always put hashtags when people come into town so they know where to share their experience. Otherwise, they're going to make up their own. Hashtag Blowing Rock. Hashtag I love Blowing Rock. Hashtag love Blowing Rock. They're going to make their own, and you have no continuity. And so I think that would be a great place. Somewhere around in there, you need to do that. But it's way too cool to be pasted on the back of a utility building. I think. Okay, and then another one. This, this musician was excellent last Saturday. 
I mean, I could hear him all over that part of town singing Rainy Nights in Georgia. He was really good. And I kept going, why don't we have one of those up there at the gazebo in Memorial Park? And you should do that like every day of the week during this time of the year. I mean, add music. It gives your cultural depth. You know, I mean, I'd add another 15 benches. Every single place there was a, a, for a person to sit, they were sitting. And, and so, I mean, they're up against planters. They're up anywhere. You could use even more benches. And you could have in add seating in the gazebo. And then, I got to tell you that when we were looking for parking, we parked down in front of the church on sunset. And the whole day I'm going, I know we're going to get a ticket. I know we're going to get a ticket. I know we saw the sheriff. The, this, I call him the sheriff. The, your parking enforcement. Walking down the street. All the tires and everything. And my whole thing is, how many tickets are we going to get and everything? And you know, if somebody gets a ticket in your town, even though they were wrong and broke the law, they're going to write you off. They were spending money in your town. How dare you not provide them with adequate parking or whatever? And, and by the way, we didn't know. When you come in town, I don't know if these parking structures, like right here, are all day or if they're also three hours. I think they're all day. And then you have three hours downtown. It should be, you should put all day. On those parking signs, I put all day parking. That gives them incentive to look for these. By the way, with your parking garage, you want to do something really novel? This is thinking out of the box. What if you charged for parking in your downtown, but it was free out there, and you run shuttles every 15 minutes? Nowadays, you pay passport parking. They pay, you pay by phone. And what's really cool, if you get close to your three hours, and let's say it's 50 cents an hour, up to three hours or four hours. What's really cool about passport parking, we've done this in Wisconsin Dells and a whole bunch of towns, is it will say, oh, you paid for one hour parking. It's going to expire in 15 minutes. Do you want to renew it for another hour? Tells you right on your phone while you're eating lunch. And you could do that up to four hours or whatever your parking is, three hours right now. And then it'll say at three hours, so your parking is about to expire. You need to go move your car. So you're warned ahead of time. And at, if you did that, you would incentivize people to park down when you get a parking garage out there somewhere. There, by the way, I saw another 2.2 acres for sale out on the highway. Somewhere you need to get parked on the highway. And if you could do that and run that free shuttle, and then you say it's free if you park out there, there is a charge if you park in town, you're going to incentivize your employees and your workers to park out there. And then having a trolley every 15 minutes, and your parking from downtown would help you pay for the parking structure. I mean, there are answers to this. And so, by the way, we went down to our vehicle like it. 7 o'clock at night, there was no ticket. I didn't realize that when we went past some certain point, they must not be checking tires anymore. I was a little bit disappointed because I thought I could hold that up and wave my flag about parking. But then on the other hand, I was really pleased that we did not get a ticket. But I had no clue that where this three-hour limit ended. I had no idea. So that's what happened on that. So, in closing, and I'm going to let you, I'll, add, I'll answer any questions. We want to hear from you. These are ideas only. We want, I mean, you may say, Roger, you're all wet. Roger, you need to see what it's like over 4th of July weekend, and I will. And, and maybe there will be lines out on 321 for miles trying to get in town. I'll see. You know, but, but there's no such thing as a dumb idea. So, I mean, I sat there and said, could we do one way? Could we widen the sidewalks, do one-way street through Main Street, you know, and just run them from, you know, Sunset and, you know, maybe from, from Boone direction headed this way. And I thought, well, wait a second. How would they, if they come up Sunset, they could only go one. You know what I mean? We're just trying to think of everything we could to make it work. So here's what you do. And you can go ahead and snap a picture of that if you want. If you go to that web link right there, bit.ly, life in blowing rock, and it's case sensitive, life in blowing rock, there is an online questionnaire there. It asks nine questions. We want to hear from you. There's nine questions. It asks where you live, what age group you're in, and then it asks, what do you think the three best things are about blowing rock? What do you think the three biggest challenges are? What would you like to see blowing rock do? 
And so that's right there for you. And, and I'm sure the paper will put it out. I know the chamber's going to put it out. I know the TDA will put it out there. We want everybody, and we don't even mind if visitors do this questionnaire. Because we ask, where do you live? So we'll know. We'll be able to separate visitors' answers from your local answers. And so I hope you'll do that. Help us get that word out there. And in closing, before I do Q&A, I love this at the museum, America's Switzerland. I mean, I just thought, wow, is that cool or what? I mean, the history of Blowing Rock was fabulous. They did a great job in the museum. Life in the village. And there was one thing that really stood out in that. And it was this, although the Great Depression devastated North Carolina's economy, Blowing Rock's tourist industry emerged relatively unscathed. Same thing happened during COVID. You're one of the few communities that saw positive results. What's funny about COVID is they were, we're getting out of Charlotte, we're getting out of the big city, so they come to Blowing Rock where there was no social distancing. <laughs> but, <laughs> but they were in the mountains in its fresh air. Tourism, not heavy industry or trade, would provide power, would power Blowing Rock's economy and shape its environment through the 20th century and into the 21st century. You could add that. You are a tourism destination. You've probably been a tourism destination since the American, since the Native Americans were here. They probably came up here, you know, and marveled at the views. And then I love this. Nowhere in America are there such conditions of scenery, climate, alluring views, of creature comfort, of outdoor sports, and all the real pleasures that make life worthwhile. It says it all. What you have here is absolutely amazing. If you can mitigate the parking and the traffic, you'll be an amazing destination. You can't just say, we don't want, vi I know there's people saying, we don't want any more visitors. But you know what? There's a lot of your businesses, they make their money during these peak seasons and these holiday weekends. And it has to carry them through those January and Februarys, you know, marches. I don't know what it's like then. But what you have, I think, is just absolutely incredible. You are so lucky. You are so lucky in spite of the traffic, in spite of the parking. I think what you have here is just amazing. Every single person we saw was having a great time. Even after the frustration, you know, of trying to find parking or, or of traffic. I mean, here's the mowing, making Boeing Rock even better thriving place to live, work, and invest in. So, and visit. Questions? Good morning. Hello. Does anybody? Yes. I don't mind the hard ones. Yeah. Yes. Yes. I noticed that all the time. I mean, and I did see yesterday people being pulled over by state troopers out there on 321. It's the first time I'd seen it. But yes, we're, we're down in Lenore. So it's, it's, 50, it's 35 in Lenore, then it goes to 55 miles an hour, then it goes down to 50, then it goes down to 35, and at 35, they're still going 55 around those corners. Yeah, it was a real problem for us. It's one reason why I want to do decorative crosswalks at sunset down there. It's the bottom of the hill. And people there, it's, I don't know what the speed limit there is, 35, right? They're going 50, right? They're blowing right through there. It's downhill both directions. They're just, and that's why I want to do some traffic calming there. There's also a section between Feckle Trout and 321. Yes. It's 25. Yes. Uh, we, us too, and that is a real problem. And you might even have to do, you know, I, I'm not a big fan of traffic cameras and stuff, but I, I do believe that you, you may need to reinforce that. I think that, and, and I've noticed that, that whole little 221 can be a real nightmare. And for us as first time visitors, we're driving a big rig because we RV'd here, we're not driving the RV, but we have a truck. And going around the corner, we're going really slow. And it's like, ah, across the center line and everything. And I understand people living down there must just, it's just a nightmare. But like us, we're going down there thinking we're going to find parking down there. And then we turn, making U-turns in the middle of the street, you know, trying to figure out where, because we couldn't find the parking. Um, but yes, I do think that probably needs to be better enforced. We notice it in both cases. Okay. Where can I find help or something? But Ransom Street is a residential street that's been there 
really long time. It goes between sunset and 321. That's become a cutoff to get into Blowing Rock because two, because Main Streets are busy. And okay. there's a huge feeding issue that okay. And, and I think if you do some wayfinding, you'll direct people. The one thing about wayfinding is you can direct people. For instance, on the south end, yeah, I would never direct people down the south end of Main Street because it's all residential. I mean, there's one business along that stretch. And that's all. These are all nice houses there, and you don't want a bunch of traffic there. Coming in from the north side from Boone, coming in that part of Main Street, you're going through primarily commercial areas. I could see that. But I try to route people up Sunset. And I think with wayfinding, now maybe the people are doing the shortcuts. I don't know if those are locals because they're trying to avoid the visitor traffic. Because I don't know visitor. I don't even know about that. And we've been here for a couple of weeks, um, you know, in May and now. And we'll be here. But I'm glad to know about that. Could you tell me which that was ranting? <laughs> no, I'm just, just kidding. Just kidding. But... Yeah, well, Ransom Street, right? Okay, yes. I don't know if you can change this or not, but you know, we, we're at Hemlock Inn on Moore Street, and anybody who uses GPS, it takes them through the residential It district, does. Back through, and I mean, it, it, if you say shortest route, it is, but you shouldn't be going there. No, that is why you need, we use GPS because you're not giving us any kind of help. If you come, if you come to the, if you're leaving my hotel, I can tell everybody looks at GPS, they turn right, go down to school, back up, back across, and there's no reason for them to be going in that. But right. I don't know if you can have that change. You can. In, in a GPS, you can't. So with Apple and Google, who are the tr two primary, there's also Navtech. Navtech provides the, the Navtech and TomTom provide the navigation systems that are built into cars. Google and Apple are primary mobile devices. In those, you can't. It will always try to route you. If it's a public street, it will try to route you that way. That is why wayfinding signage is so important. Because even being here, if we saw a sign to wayfind, if we saw a wayfinding sign, we will go by that rather than go by what our GPS is telling me. Because we know it's either going to be safer, it's going to be easier, and sometimes the quickest route is not the best route. And in your NAS system, you say, I want the quickest route or the shortest route. And the shortest route will take you down, you know, a Ransom Street or the shortest way when you want, no, I want a quicker way, and that's your two choices. But it will, it'll give you every public street. Just like us going out there to the zip line place, and somebody said, there's another way out there. I don't know how it is, but every time we try to do it, it tried, took us on that dirt road that I call 5,000 Bottles Drive. You know, because it, and 5,000 5, potholes might be kind to how many there actually were. But yeah, but, but you're right. You cannot change that on there. But that is where wayfinding signage can mitigate your traffic. Yes. So I'm going to piggyback off of that. So you sure. mentioned the countywide wayfinding signage, and we're working on that through our county PDA okay. and, the, and the town of Boone PDA. So we had selected a vendor. We were out to bid. All of our signs have been designed. All the engineering's been done. Um, and then we kind of hit the brakes with it because literally it was, we got the bids back at the end of March of 2020. And so our board just kind of... And they were a million bucks or whatever. Um, so we're about to get that started again. Our okay. biggest challenge right now, and I'm sure you've heard this before, is dealing with the DOT. Yes. So you mentioned on some of your things that there was a limit of, of five things that could be on a sign. Right. State DOT in North Carolina is telling us we can only have three, but I can point to examples from all other places in North Carolina so can we. that have more than that. And your district engineer should be on this team. And by the way, Blowing Rock is in two counties. Right. And so that creates kind of a problem. But when we bring in DOT, and by the way, you're not saying DOT want you to pay for it. We'll pay for it if you will help us out. Yeah, the, the, and sometimes we've even gone to state legislators to push them in the right direction to make it happen. Because your main street here is, is state highway. Yeah. And 221, 321, I mean, they call that the bypass. I can't even imagine what that'd be like when this used to be, this used to be the main highway right through the middle of your downtown. 321 was one lane. Oh, it was just two lanes rather than five or whatever it is now. That's a, I mean, that's come up multiple times in conversations. So, when you
when you get into downtown Blowing Rock or you get into downtown Boone, it's different what we can put on the sign. Right. On the outlying areas, 321 and, and, and otherwise, so we can't even name historic attractions. We can't name Sky Valley Zip Tour on the DOT approved wayfinding signage. I either have to say okay. attraction, which uh -huh. gives them no information. Right. I don't know if we could get by with zip line. We might well, be able to get by with, with that. And I, and, and I don't know North Carolina law, but I've actually testified in a lot of legislatures about this. You have to understand, the Department of, first of all, Department of Transportation, they always feel like they're the IRS, they're always getting beat up. Yeah. So they're always defensive. Yeah. Number two, DOTs, their primary thing is public safety, and number two is moving traffic. But did you know that congestion is the downtown's very best friends? So in most states now, we've actually gone to state legislators and testified saying you need to add a third element, which is economic development. You can't, let, you can't kill your towns because of your rules. But I'm shocked that North Carolina does not have Todd signage. That's tourism-oriented displays, the blue ones. And on the blue ones, you can put Tanger outlets, you know, gas, food, lodging. They do, and so we're making that argument. If they allow okay. that type of, of signage through a state DOT program, why can't we at least put our historic attractions like the Blowing Rock? You should, and those would be brown signs. Historic attractions that are nonprofits should have, they're the brown signs you see on highways. According to U.S. highway standards, federal highway standards, Brown signs are for historic attractions, like historic downtown, those types of things. The blue ones are Todd, which is tourism-oriented displays, which businesses actually pay for. And then, and then, of course, there's the green one, which are just directional signs. And, and so... And, and we can do that, but our issue was, coming back to the whole branding and everything matching with the signage, we wanted it all to tie into the countywide... Look and feel. Signage. Look and feel, but they won't, they'll allow that type of name recognition on the Todd sign and on the brown sign and on the blue visitor information signs, but they won't, it doesn't transcend into a countywide community. Here's program. my question for you. Why does it work in Hickory and not here? Uh, we've asked they're on the highway to, too. We've asked that and they're question. decorative to Hickory. <laughs> we've gone to our state legislators who have, okay. have been helpful in asking the question at the state level, um, and it's just basically stuck. When they went to the so, state engineer at DOT, he came back and said, well, countywide wayfinding programs are not even allowed in North Carolina. I'm like, you got to be kidding me. They're all over the place. Yeah, yeah. So we're kind of I, at this sticking point. Now. So we had this problem in the state of Utah. And what we did is we got the state tourism director, the state economic development director, the state Main Street director. We got, these are state agencies. We got all of them together. They went over to the governor and the lieutenant governor, had this conversation. And then they, then the governor started dictating to their staff. And then we had, lesser, we had legislators putting pressure on them to implement it. And they did. They changed it. It took them 24 months to do it. But you may be dealing with the district engineer that, you know, I'm not too sure. I mean, everybody has their own kingdom, and sometimes that creates a problem. But there should be ways to do. And in your downtown, you don't want... The highway signage that's right across from Speckled Trout just looks awful. And you say, we want to put decorative signs. We'll still use the state symbols and everything. We'll, we'll match federal highway standards, but we just want it to fit the ambience of our downtown. And, I'd be, and I'd, I think you'll get them to do that. And I, I should go ask the folks in Mount Airy what, the, what they did about that, because they, they were trying to make theirs retro a few years ago to kind of fit. But... That's a good problem, and that is a challenge. Your Main Street. We've worked in many times where they say, state, give us back that highway. Your only challenge is between 321 and 221. That's a connector to those two highways. But the rest of Main Street, we've actually seen towns say, we'll just take it back. I know we'll have to maintain it and everything. Just give it back to us. We'll be in control of our own destiny. So there are, you can do that. It's going to add a cost for snow removal and some things because now the state's not doing it, but, but sometimes you have to do that to be in charge of your own destiny. You know, I, I hope, that's not much of an answer, but I feel your pain for sure. And I've been there many, many times. We'll, I'm going to do we'll, one, we'll continue to fight the battle, but we have basically shelved the project. You know, and that's really a shame. And so now we're just going to start with phase one, which is outlying getting people from as they come into the county in right. the areas, and then hopefully we can solve this by phase two and phase three, 
Yeah. And hopefully we'll have people from DOT even watch this little video that we're creating right here. I mean, from an outsider's perspective, we're trying to mitigate traffic just like they are. We're concerned about public safety. I would like to see you do decorative sidewalks. Well, they let you even do that. You know what I mean? Those kinds of things can make a big difference. So, yeah, in the back. Yes, ma'am. Public restrooms. Right. So, yeah, well, and, and number one is, so let's talk about public restrooms. And by the way, there's a little quote I always use, relieved visitors spend more. <laughs> it's absolutely true. Think about this, McDonald's. 70% of the people that go into McDonald's to use for the sole purpose of using the restroom 70% of them will buy something, 50% out of guilt. They call it guilt sales. They do. We use the restroom, we better buy something. And the other half buy out of impulse. But here's the point. You cannot be a public restroom because then your, pub, your restrooms in your shop need to be ADA. You start running into all kinds of problems. What we, what we did in Wickford, Rhode Island, is what a merchant did. They never said no public restrooms or for customers only. What they said is right on their door, it said public restrooms across the street at such and such. Now, in our times here, we're going to be here over the 4th of July. We're going to be here for your parade. We're going to be here. We'll watch it. But in our case, almost everywhere we went, we found, we found restrooms at, at the museum near the parking lot. Those restrooms. Then there's the restrooms right in, um, right in uh, uh, Memorial Park. Um, plus, you put up some other uh, uh, portable restrooms, I noticed, during the peak season. Or maybe that's getting ready for 4th of July. I don't know. Um, and then we saw restrooms on retail shop. There's one of your retail shops. If you go down Main on the right, that kind of sets back in. And there's, yeah, and, there's, they have re and they just have one sign in there, which good for them. If you're in their little shopping, you'll see restrooms right around the corner. And you know what? We went in the, we used those restrooms. And because of that, guilt sales, we made sure we spent some money in that little row of shops. We had no problem finding restrooms. You know, if we, but you have to, have to understand that we were out looking for them specifically because we're doing an assessment. But I do think that merchants can, I, you know, I would like to see on these maps, you have that one map at the parking area. I'd like to see those in a couple of areas that show where the parking lots are and where public restrooms are. And in the, in the guide, it does, the map does show where public restrooms are. Um, but that is really, really important. But I urge merchants not to put no public restrooms or, or you know, just tell us where. I say never say no, just tell me where I can go. <laughs> literally and and so hopefully that answers that but yes and and I don't know I'll see this weekend if you're short on supply of public restrooms um, hats off to the town or whoever because all the restrooms we went in were well maintained you know we didn't see piles of trash or toilet paper um, the one next to the police station next to Memorial Park I mean there's people in there cleaning that one all the time it's probably the busiest and so our hats off to the town or whoever for doing that. But yeah. So, yes. I'm sure you get this question all the time. But, uh, Broughton Street in Savannah, historic district. Perfect. They now, they now have a McDonald's and a Starbucks. Broughton <laughs> Street is a historic Charleston now has three Starbucks within a mile. Yes. Generic America. Yes. A big selling point here is that it isn't. How, what would you advise? Community? Yes. How do you if, advise them to keep from going? To okay. If, and I, that's such a good question. On Main Street and Sunset, 
or even in your downtown, I would create a zoning ordinance. Now, this is always tough to do. I would create a zoning ordinance that does not allow chains and franchises in your historic district, whatever the boundaries are. Cities are doing that everywhere. And they're learning the hard way. We're, as a matter of fact, in about a month, I'm going to be in Deadwood, South Dakota. It's Old West. The whole downtown is Old West. And guess what? Dairy Queen is in the middle of their downtown with their red and white sign. I mean, it's just like, ah! And the locals, even the visitors complain. We had to have them in Springdale, Arizona, Springdale Utah. At the, right there, Subway thought there's so many people going to design, we want to put a Subway there. And Subway sued the town of Springdale into submission. But guess what happened? Nobody would go to Subway and they left. <laughs> I mean, people were so pissed, visitors included. But I think the way to do it is you create a zoning overlay just over this. We're, you're fine out on the highway. You're fine in certain areas. I mean, I remember when Durham, North Carolina, made 60 minutes as the weight loss capital of the world. This is a long time ago. And they had a part of Durham that they called Sin City. That's where all the fast food and everything was. But, but for you, I would absolutely, because the people are doing this, once, once they're in, they're grandfathered in. Even if you create zoning ordinances, you can't get them out unless you buy them out. And that's what happened to Carmel, too. So Carmel, all these places. I would do a zoning overlay over your downtown that does not allow chains and franchises. There's a couple reasons for doing this. Number one, it makes you authentic to who you are without gentrifying what you have, which is an exceptional experience. You know what? We're in your downtown for your shops and restaurants. We're not in your downtown for the views. We can get that at the Blowing Rock. We can get that all over the place. We're in your downtown because of your restaurants and shops. And if you start gentrifying those like Carmel, Carmel, California had one visitor on the beach for every 100 people shopping. You know what it is now? 40 people on the beach for 40 people shopping because they lost their soul. I could get what they have downtown anywhere. And you don't want to go down that path. The other reason you don't want to do this is because your landlords will get they will raise the rents higher and higher and higher and higher until the only people that can afford them is a sunglass on Main Street, Sunglass Hut. No offense, Sunglass Hut. I buy sunglasses there, but I don't need to come to Blowing Rock to do it, or a Subway, or a Dairy Queen or McDonald's. I mean, it's the last thing you want to do. It will destroy your town so fast, you will no longer be an authentic destination that you are today. I mean, that's, it's, a, it's a huge thing to do for a town to dictate to property owners who or what they can have in their businesses. But I also believe that what you will do with that is say, and by the way, when you have a vacancy, let us, the town, our economic development people, we will help you find the right tenant so that you're there for them. We're going to impose this on you, but in exchange, we will help you find the right tenant so that it's a two-way street. What's that? Tillman's is a franchise. Another business right down from it that's a franchise. And you might you might see real estate offices like Kilwins. You know, Kilwins, I you know, I don't know how many Kilwins they are if they're native to north it to, to they're north. Everywhere. They're everywhere. Okay. And I've seen Kilwins in other areas. Um, oh well, heck, they have one at the mall, at the Tanger Outlets. Yeah, and, and by the way, they're grandfathered in. You know, but I would have, and by the way, their chocolate and their ice cream is really good. So, you know, so in that case, you can't make exceptions. So that's a problem. Say, well, we'll let a franchise ice cream candy shop in, but we're not going to let a Starbucks in. You know, so it has to be one all. But they're here. They're grandfathered in. And by the way, that's the place we've seen the biggest lines. <laughs> that if there was ever a place that could print money, it's Kilwins. And, and you know what? So hats off to them. At least, they, you know what? They don't have Dairy Queen colors and everything. They tend, to, they tend to blend in a little better than maybe a lot of franchises would. But yeah, and they've been here for a long time. And so, you know, they're grandfathered in. But what you don't want is the Subways and those. And no offense to Subway. I eat at Subway. I eat at Dairy Queen. I eat at all these places. But I just think you don't want to sell your soul or lose your soul. And I think what makes Blowing Rock really cool is this mix of businesses and eateries and your lodging. Those three things are exceptional in one of the most beautiful settings in North America.
I, I, you know, so yes. So in your presentation, you were talking about businesses and commenting on how they made more pedestrian friendly. More. So what other ideas for downtown Main Street do you think would be good to draw more of that pedestrian focus? Well, it, if you did a parking structure or two, whatever you do, if you did that in the trolleys, you solved your parking issue by putting more of it out there than you have downtown. I think, I think that 10, 15 years down the road, Main Street wouldn't have cars. I mean, that's happening across the United States. Now, I always tell people, you do not get rid of cars on your Main Street until it's so busy you have no choice. Well, you're bridging that already. You should have 20-foot sidewalks, not 8-foot. You should have 20-foot sidewalks. Because right now, we want your merchants to put out their, they put out displays next to their facades. We want those benches, and you're barely able to keep up with ADA. In Asheville, they just have like cracks in the sidewalk, and they'll just say, keep the chairs on that side of the crack. But you know what? They've, and they have places where in Asheville, you can't even get ADA. But they notice them. Asheville has never been sued because what happens is they'll sit there. We actually watch restaurants. If somebody was coming down the road in a wheelchair with a stroller, and somebody's out in the sidewalk cafe and their chair's kind of out in their space, they say, oh, excuse me, and they move their chair in. I would like to see you do more outdoor dining, you know, but then you can, there's ways to do it without putting it, you could put it on the sidewalk and they'll route pedestrians around it, but then you got to get rid of the cars in that space. Down the road, the future of downtowns is pedestrians only. We built our culture on cars, and that's coming in. Italy is the most, one of the most visited, country, visited countries on the planet for a reason. They were built before cars. Even, and, and it still works today, piazzas, a central plaza. Um, I, I could see, I would love to see you have 20-foot sidewalks. You have 99 spaces on Main Street. If we could create 200 spaces to accommodate that plus 100 more down there, I think over time you could widen your sidewalks, you also have no bike lanes and no bike racks. With Middle Fork Greenway coming. Middle, with the Middle Fork Greenway coming. You have no bikes and bike racks. We need a bike lane. You can do wider sidewalks, a bike lane, and you could even do street trees that way out there. But you would need to get rid of that parking on Main Street. You have a couple places where it's angled in parking. And by the way, angle in parking will increase retail sales by a third over parallel parking. Isn't that something? Think about this. Oh, that's a cute shop. Pull in quick. Oh, that's a cute shop. Yeah, do I want to buy it? I, yeah, I don't know if I want to try this parallel parking thing. I mean, we're teaching cars how to parallel park themselves now, right? But, but that's another thing. But I think over time, you're going to have wider sidewalks, narrower, you know, your streets I think are fine. It's a nice intimate setting. But I think you'll have wider sidewalks, bike lanes, bike racks, and, and more beautification. You could even create a two-foot buffer between this actual lane of traffic, you know, and, and then your bike lane on the inside of that, and then your sidewalk. And they might be 14 feet wide. You know, I don't know how, how wide you could go. I think that's the future. I think you need to, if you do comprehensive plan or any kind of long-term plan, I think you need to start thinking that way. I would like to see Memorial Park. I love Memorial Park, but man, I thought somewhere we need a plaza with a stage, you know, where you can do cooking demonstrations, or you could have bands, or you could have any kind of performances, you know, that would be open. I'm not saying get rid of it, but you have tennis courts and stuff there, and I kept going, man, I would really like to see an actual piazza here, you know, a place where we can do performances, you know, without having to close off Main Street, you know. Um, so I think you could do that. I think what the merchants do are great. We love blade signs. Blade signs are perpendicular to us. I think you have those. We love awnings. A lot of your businesses have nice awnings. Um, I mean, I think your merchants do a fabulous job with window displays, extending window displays to outside spaces. Uh, I think your frontline employees are exceptional. You don't have enough of them. And by the way, almost every place in town has, we need help. Um, and that is not a problem that's unique to Blowing Rock. It's happening all over the country. Um, right now, um, and I don't want to get into politics, but sometimes we incentivize people not to go back to work. Um, and, and, and then there's another flip side where a lot of times frontline employees, hotel workers, restaurant workers, they're there because it's not, they don't really see it as their career. And now that they were laid off due to COVID and everything, they're saying, I'm, I don't even want to go back to that. I'm going to go do something else. So there's a combination of things. 
and that's 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 also happening right now. And that's something we have to deal with too. So, um, and some of your retailers are already dealing with it. But really, everywhere we went, excellent customer service. The people in the shops were great. One thing I'd like to see in some of your shops is little signs that say we also ship. So when you get people that fly in, you know they're flying into Charlotte and they're out here in the mountains and and they want to buy things, but they don't, they don't have room in their luggage to take it back home. If you just put little signs inside some of your real shows, I'm happy to ship this for you. And then, of course, you're going to charge them for the boxing and everything. I think that would be another thing you could do. That's what they did in Carmel, California, um, and other places like that. They do stuff like that. So is that helpful? Yes. So, um, I love these questions. These are great. So in the, in the resort towns of North Carolina on the coast, uh, yeah. They have embraced paid parking. Directly. They have. Um, Rightful is $5 an hour. And they, they subsidize their town budget substantially with that. So I mean, just as an example, we have you know, three. So what's somewhere in that continuum? What makes sense in terms of so, should it be variable pricing from you know, high to free? Right. Or so here, here's, and we've studied this a lot. We actually did a whole video on parking. There's a book out there called The High Cost of Free Parking. And, and it's a good book. It's hard to read. It's taken me years. I still haven't gotten through the whole thing. <laughs> but parking doesn't have to be free. It has to be worth it. So if you go to a Carolina Panthers game, you might pay 20 bucks to park there for a three-hour football game. Well, people think it's worth it to go to the game. Hopefully, they'll be able to do that this year. But, but, or wherever it is, could be college, could be anything. But on the other hand, um, I, ooh, I like example. Walnut Creek did a cool thing. They did a dollar an hour up to three hours, and after that, it's free. They incentivized people to stay longer. And people say, it's free now, let's just stay another hour. And guess what? They're spending money. But I think it needs to be worth it. I think when people in this downtown tell me I'd rather pay the $8 ticket than move my car, it tells them that they're willing to pay that kind of money. Now, I'm not saying that should be a price. If I was in Blowing Rock, I would probably do 50 cents to a dollar an hour up to three or four hours. I would do four hours. I would do four hour parking. So you could say, okay, it's, it's, it's a dollar an hour up to three hours. The fourth hour is free. Incentivize them to stay. Now, here's what towns do. We have three-hour parking because we, we cannot get our employees to park somewhere else. We're going to punish our customers instead. Right. I, I just, you know, and the merchant said, don't park in front of our park. Don't park in front of our shop. Park in front of theirs. And then that shop said, don't park in front of our I mean, you know what? You're not accomplishing anything. Um, and so, but I think if you had paid parking in this downtown and it was free out there, out there and you did this out there, I think it would be a win-win. First of all, this town is worth paying a few bucks to park in. It is. What about valet parking? Valet parking, I think, is great for lodging establishments. In a downtown, that's difficult because now you have families, you're blocking traffic. I got to tell you, when we, here's our parking experience, is we did all these along Main Street, you know, back on this side. We did all the parking. They were all full on Saturday. We ended up going down Sunset, and we... And there was a car pulling out of that church. Charles, what's the church? Baptist. Oh, there you are, right there. First Baptist Church. He said, Charles, we ran into each other, and he said, yeah, that's my church. And so we parked in front of his church. But there was a car there. People were getting in front of the car. So what I did is I stopped at that intersection, and we sat there. Traffic is backing up Sunset now, right? They're coming out Sunset, coming down Sunset. We're stopped, waiting for these people to get in the car. They get in the car, they have their reverse lights on, and they're not moving. They were on their phones. So Jane gets out of our truck, walks up to them, is about ready to knock on the door, and they go, oh, oops, and then they back up, move out. One car, I blocked up traffic probably halfway, if not more than that, just to Main Street. So just to get, there was the only parking spot. And by God, I didn't care what the tickets added up to. I wasn't going to move. It turned out it was free down there. You know, thank, thank you to the church. Thank them. And there should, be a, there should be a donation box there, too. 
You can use our parking, except, the, you know, like Rumple Church did. So anyway, with valet parking, the challenge is, are you going to back up traffic while you're dealing with, and this happens in urban areas like San Francisco and other urban areas. Um, I'm all for valet parking. I th yeah, at Cellar, there's no way we could even pull into their lot, you know, with our rig. Um, so we parked in the same spot in front of Charles' church. I'm going to get a bill now. <laughs> no, just kidding. Um, and, and so, but anyway, a valley parking, I think it's great. It's tough to do in a downtown. Um, um, we've seen it work kind of. Some people have a choice. You know, you can valet, you can park over here in public parking. Um, but, but I do believe that it's a, by charging for parking in downtown, you can help offset the cost of building a parking structure out on the highway. And if you make that free parking here, there's pay parking in town, you're, and we have shuttles every 15 minutes, you're gonna fill those up first. And your employees are gonna go there. Because the last thing, an employee, and by the way, these days we do digital parking, there's no meters with a bunch of quarters, nickels, and dimes in them. Those days are over. It's all digital, it's passport parking. And by the way, they fund the whole thing. And they get a percentage. Or, or a lot of times, if you already had paid parking, and then you switch it over to that, they do an add-on that I, the shopper, pays for. In your case, it would just be built in. And it's easy. You just have an app. And outside there, you might have a little post with just a little number on it and a QR code. And it'll just say, it's, you set it up, and how would you like to pay? Would you like to pay for one hour, two hours, three hours, or four hours? And that fourth hour is free, maybe. I mean, I'm just throwing out ideas here. But I think your downtown is worth paying for. I don't know that I would go more than that. We don't want to incentivize people to not come to Bowling Rock. You know, I, you know but I, I think a buck an hour up to three hours, three bucks for four hours in this downtown, I think that's a piece of cake. I don't think anybody would argue with that. Your employees would say, I'm going to park out there then. So one thing about doing that, you need to have an alternative. Now, you could say, well, we're going to charge for parking on Main Street, but we're not going to charge parking in these garages. But the problem is the garages are already full, and now you're, you know, you compound the frustration that way. Make sense? Any other questions? Yes. How do businesses, bigger businesses along the 321 corridor, how can they play a part in helping with this uh, new business of downtown? Um, I think... That's a good question. I mean, I like, you know, the shuttle right now that stops at hotels and then comes downtown. I think that's a benefit for them. I, my only challenge with that is it's 22 minutes instead of 15 minutes to get from wherever the shuttle is downtown. So maybe it's, you know, and, and it, you know, it runs like every half hour roughly. Um, and so I think that, but, but I think it's important. I think wayfinding would be important. Uh, you know, your downtown is the draw, not the highway. No offense to Outback Steakhouse and Holiday Inn and all the ones out there. Um, that's a commercial corridor out there. Um, I mean, they're listed in all your marketing materials. And if you like Outback Steakhouse, which I happen to like, fine, I'll go down there. But really, we're here not for chains. We're here because we want to see, eat, and shop where it's unique to only you and nowhere else. And we'll, and we'll give we'll give chocolate and ice cream, we'll give them a pass. <laughs> you know, even, even though Killens we can find right over here at Tanger Outlet. Um, um, but I do, that. that's a little trickier just because of where they are. And by the way, like the speed, like I said, if we could do traffic calming down there, just by decorating that intersection, creating some gateways down there, because right now people just blow right past centers, or, right past that sh the street. Um, they just, just blow right past it. I mean, it's just like unbelievable. So I think you've got to slow people down out there. But the more lanes you have and the wider the lanes, the faster they're going to go. i got to tell you a story. And maybe I'll close on this. We're working in Springdale, Utah. Four million people, four and a half million people going into Zion. And it's right there at the gateway. And Utah Department of Transportation designed the whole thing. They were going to narrow the sidewalks in downtown Springdale, which is like one mile long. Remember, population is 600. By the way, the population is 600. Their merchants are open until 9 o'clock at night. Okay, so they were going to widen the highway to push more traffic through Springdale. And I went to them 
I went to the state tourism director, the state economic development director, the head of DOT, and I said, I beg you not to do this. What I want you to do is narrow the highway and widen the sidewalks. There's already that shuttle that I showed you in the slides going through downtown. And what the town will do is put a parking lot at this end of downtown and that end of downtown. They will encourage people to park at each end of downtown and then take the shuttle up to the park. But we want people to be on foot in this downtown because that is how this downtown lives or dies. And to their credit, they threw away hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of planning and redid it. They narrowed the highway, they widened the sidewalks, the town put the parking structures, their retail sales and services doubled. And guess what? Within two years of that, that was two years ago, within two years of that, Springdale became the, my, became the draw, and while we're there, we're going to go into Zion. So, one statistic, I want to give you three statistics. I call this the 787 rule. 70, 80, 70. 70% 70 of first-time sales comes from curb appeal. We all have done this. We all travel. Have you ever said these words? That looks like a nice place to eat. That looks like a great shop. I think your merchants do a great job of that. But I gotta tell you, down like at that Cenex, I don't know if I'd ever go in there because it just doesn't have any curb appeal. I don't even know what their gas prices are. Maybe that's because of signage ordinances. But once again, it just doesn't look friendly or easy to get into, and no offense. But, but like Outback Steakhouse looks nice. I'm trying to think of the ones out there, you know, but curb appeal is absolutely crazy. 70% of first time sales comes from curb appeal. Middle one, 80. 80% 80 of all retail spending is by women. I already said it, I'm gonna say it again. Women also make 70% of the decisions of where we shop, where we live, where we stay, where we vacation. Now here's where the guys use the pipe in and say, tell me something I didn't already know. But that's absolutely true, and I'm not being facetious with that. The third one is 70% of all consumer retail spending takes place after 6 p.m. Let me say that again. 70% of all consumer retail spending takes place after 6 p.m. Are you open? You want to know where that comes from is the National Retail Federation. You may say, yeah, but that's Walmart, Barnes & Noble, Walgreens, CVS, Safeway, you know, all, all of those. Yes, but it still applies to small retailers. Think about where you're at. We might go to, we might go to uh, the Blowing Rock. We might go over to Grandfather Mountain. We might go hike over at the state park over there at Grandfather. We might go into Banner Elk. I mean, we might go play around a golf. We might go hiking. We might do all this outdoor recreation that you're famous for. And then we come back at the end of the day and you're closed. I can't tell you what I saw retailers walking up and down your main street doing this in front of store windows. Looking in the store windows, you're closed. In Asheville, it's a little different. Their retailers close at 7. So what they have is the shopping and dining kind of go together, and they're open until 7. But then it's like dining and entertainment in Asheville after that. So their retailers are only open until 7. But I think, you know, in a lot of countries, we have siestas. Businesses will shut down in the afternoon for two or three hours, and then they will reopen in, later in the evening hours. Now, I'm not saying this is something you should tackle today where we can't even get employees to work regularly 9 to 6. You'd be better off opening 10 to 7 or 11 to 8 than you would be open just 9 to 6. Now, in your case, people are coming here for your shopping more than they're coming here for outdoor recreation. So I don't think it's a problem you have to address now. But I also want you to know that the average time Americans eat dinner now is 7.30. Used to be 6, 5.30 and 6. We're eating, in Western Europe, the average time for dinner is 9 o'clock. We're moving that way in the United States. So I just want you to think that in the future, we're shifting more to evenings for dining and shopping. So for you, I don't think it's a big problem. I will tell you that I went over to the woodworking shop, you know, right on Sunset, right? Yeah. And I went in there, and I was going to buy, they have these really cool little furnaces. 
You put rubbing alcohol in it, and it's, it's really cool. They're like 95 bucks. I, I told him, I'm going to be back to buy one. I went back at like 5.30. It was already closed. I was like, really? You're not even open until 6? I gave him a bad time the next day because I did go back, luckily, and I said, I wish you would have been open yesterday. I wanted to buy it yesterday, but hey, I'm here today. But, but I wish you would have some consistency in your business hours. You know, if you're going to be closed one day a week, let it be a Monday, except holidays, like this coming Monday. You know, I would, if you have some consistency in your hours and stuff, I think that would be very helpful to business, for visitors. So, but no shopping, closing at five is, close at six at least. So, make sense? Okay, thank you so much for spending the morning with me. Thank you very, very much. Look, I have business cards up here if you want to email me directly with your input.